Introduction of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Introduction. Niccolo Machiavelli, the first great Italian historian and one of the most eminent political writers of any age or country, was born at Florence, May 3, 1469. He was of an old, though not wealthy, Tuscan family. His father, who was a jurist, dying when Niccolo was sixteen years old. We know nothing of Machiavelli's youth and little about his studies. He does not seem to have received the usual humanistic education of his time, as he knew no Greek. The first notice of Machiavelli is in 1498, when we find him holding the office of secretary in the second chancery of the Signoria, which office he retained till the downfall of the Florentine Republic in 1512. His unusual ability was soon recognized, and in 1500 he was sent on a mission to Louis XII of France and afterwards on an embassy to Caesar Borgia, the lord of Romagna at Orbino. Machiavelli's report and description of this and subsequent embassies to this prince shows his undisguised admiration for the courage and cunning of Caesar, who was a master in the application of the principles afterwards exposed in such a skillful and uncompromising master by Machiavelli in his prince. The limits of this introduction will not permit us to follow with any detail the many important duties with which he was charged by his native state, all of which he fulfilled with the utmost fidelity and with consummate skill. When, after the Battle of Ravenna in 1512, the Holy League determined upon the downfall of Pier Sodierni, Gonfalonieri of the Florentine Republic, and the restoration of the Medici, the efforts of Machiavelli, who was an ardent Republican, were in vain. The troops he had helped organize fled before the Spaniards, and the Medici were returned to power. Machiavelli attempted to conciliate his new masters, but he was deprived of his office, and being accused in the following year of the participation in the conspiracy of Boccali and Caponi, he was imprisoned and tortured, though afterwards set at liberty by Pope Leo X. He now retired to a small estate near San Casciano, seven miles from Florence. Here he devoted himself to political and historical studies, and though apparently retired from public life, his letters show the deep and passionate interest he took in the political vicissitudes through which Italy was then passing, and in all of which the singleness of purpose with which he continued to advance to his native Florence is clearly manifested. It was during his retirement upon his little estate at San Casciano that Machiavelli wrote The Prince, the most famous of all his writings, and here also he began a much more extensive work, his Discourses on the Decades of Livy, which continued to occupy him for several years. These discourses, which do not form a continuous commentary on Livy, give Machiavelli an opportunity to express his own views on the government of the state, a task for which his long and varied political experience and an assiduous study of the ancients rendered him eminently qualified. The Discourses and the prints, written at the same time, supplement each other, and are really one work. Indeed, the treatise, The Art of War, though not written till 1520, should be mentioned here because of its intimate connection with these two treatises, it being, in fact, a further development of some of the thoughts expressed in the Discorsi. The prints, a short work, divided into 26 books, is the best known of all Machiavelli's writings, Herein he expresses in his own masterly way his views on the founding of a new state, taking for his type and model Caesar Borgia, though the latter had failed in his schemes for the consolidation of his power in the Romagna. The principles here laid down were the natural outgrowth of the confused political conditions of his time, and as in the Principe, as its name indicates, Machiavelli is chiefly concerned with the government of a prince. So the Dioscori treat principally of the Republic, and here Machiavelli's model republic was the Roman Commonwealth, the most successful and enduring example of popular government. Free Rome is the embodiment of his political idea of the state. Much that Machiavelli says in this treatise is as true today and holds as good as the day it was written. 
and to us there is much that is of especial importance. To select a chapter, almost at random, let us take Book 1, Chapter 15. Quote, Public affairs are easily managed in a city where the body of the people is not corrupt, and where equality exists. There no principality can be established, nor can a republic be established where there is no equality. No man has been more harshly judged than Machiavelli, especially in the two centuries following his death. But he has since found many able champions, and the tide has turned. The prince has been termed a manual for tyrants, the effect of which has been most pernicious. But were Machiavelli's doctrines really new? Did he discover them? He merely had the candor and courage to write down what everybody was thinking and what everybody knew. He merely gives us the impression he had received from a long and intimate intercourse with princes in the affairs of state. It was Lord Bacon, I believe, who said that Machiavelli tells us what princes do, not what they ought to do. When Machiavelli takes Caesar Borgia as his model, he in no wise extols him as a hero, but merely as a prince, who has been capable of attending the end in view. The life of the state was the primary object. It must be maintained, and Machiavelli has laid down the principles, based on his study and wide experience, by which this may be accomplished. He wrote from the point of view of the politician, not the moralist. What is good politics may be bad morals, and in fact, by a strange fatality, where morals and politics clash, the latter generally gets the upper hand. And while anyone contend that the principles set forth by Machiavelli in his prince or his discourses have entirely perished from the earth, has diplomacy been entirely stripped of fraud and duplicity? Let anyone read the famous 18th chapter of the prince. Quote, in what manner princes should keep their faith? And he will be convinced that what was true nearly 400 years ago is quite as true today. Of the remaining works of Machiavelli, the most important is the history of Florence, written between 1521 and 1525, and dedicated to Clement the Seventh. The first book is merely a rapid review of the Middle Ages, the history of Florence beginning with Book Two. Machiavelli's method has been censured for adhering at times too closely to the chroniclers like Villani, Cambi, and Giovanni Cavacante and at others rejecting their testimony without apparent reason, while in its details the authority of his history is often questionable. It is the straightforward, logical narrative, which always holds the interest of the reader, that is the greatest charm of the history. Of the other works of Machiavelli, we may mention here his comedies, the Mandralaga, the Clesia, and his novel, Balfigor. After the downfall of the Republic, and Machiavelli's release from prison in 1513, fortune seems never again to have favored him. It is true that in 1520, Guiliano de' Medici commissioned him to write his History of Florence, and he afterwards held a number of offices, yet these latter were entirely beneath his merits. He had been married in 1502 to Mariatta Corsini, who bore him four sons and a daughter. He died on June 22, 1527, leaving his family in the greatest poverty, a sterling tribute to his honesty, when one considers the many opportunities he doubtless had to enrich himself. Machiavelli's life was not without blemish. Few lives are. We must bear in mind the atmosphere of craft, hypocrisy, and poison in which he lived. His was the age of Caesar Borgia, and of popes like the monster Alexander the Sixth and Julius the Second. Whatever his faults may have been, Machiavelli was always an ardent patriot and an earnest supporter of popular government. It is true that he was willing to accept a prince if one could be found courageous enough and prudent enough to unite dismembered Italy, for in the unity of his native land he saw the only hope of its salvation. Machiavelli is buried in the church of Santa Croce at Florence, beside the tomb of Michelangelo. His monument bears this inscription, tanto nomini nullum par eulogium, and though this praise is doubtless exaggerated, he is a son of whom his country may be justly proud. End of Introduction Book One, Chapter One of A History of Florence This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown, Book 1, Chapter 1. Eruption of Northern People upon the Roman Territories. Visigoths. Barbarians called in by Stilicho. Vandals in Africa. Franks and Burgundians give their names to France and Burgundy. The Huns. Angles give the name to England. Attila, King of the Huns in Italy. Genseric takes Rome. The Lombards. The people who inhabit the northern parts beyond the Rhine and the Danube, living in a healthy and prolific region, frequently increase to such vast multitudes that part of them are compelled to abandon their native soil and seek a habitation in other countries. The method adopted, when one of these provinces had to be relieved of its superabundant population, was to divide into three parts, each containing an equal number of nobles and of people, of rich and of poor. The third, on whom the lot fell, then went in search of new abodes, leaving the remaining two-thirds in possession of their native country. These migrating masses destroyed the Roman Empire by the facilities for settlement which the country offered when the emperors abandoned Rome, the ancient seat of their dominion, and fixed their residence at Constantinople, for by this step they exposed the Western Empire to the rapine of both their ministers and their enemies, the remoteness of their position preventing them either from seeing or providing for his necessities. To suffer the overthrow of such an extensive empire, established by the blood of so many brave and virtuous men, showed no less folly in the princes themselves than infidelity in their ministers. For not one eruption alone, but many, contributed to its ruin, and these barbarians exhibited much ability and perseverance in accomplishing their object. The first of these northern nations that invaded the empire after the Cimbrians, who were conquered by Gaius Marius, was the Visigoths, which name in our language signifies Western Goths. These, after some battles fought along its confines, long held their seat of dominion upon the Danube, with consent of the emperors, and although, moved by various causes, they often attacked the Roman provinces, they were always kept in subjugation by the imperial forces. The emperor Theodosius conquered them with great glory, and, being wholly reduced to his power, they no longer selected a sovereign of their own, but satisfied with the terms which he granted them, lived and fought under his ensigns and authority. On the death of Theodosius, his sons, Arcadius and Honorius, succeeded to the empire, but not to the talents and fortune of their father, and the times became changed with the princes. Theodosius had appointed a governor to each of the three divisions of the empire, Rufinus to the eastern, to the west Stilicho, and Gildo to the African. Each of these, after the death of Theodosius, determined not to be governors merely, but to assume sovereign dominion over their respective provinces. Gildo and Rufinus were suppressed at their onset, but Stilicho, concealing his design, ingratiated himself with the new emperors, and at the same time so disturbed their government as to facilitate his occupation of it afterwards. To make the Visigoths their enemies, he advised that the accustomed stipend allowed to this people should be withheld, and, as he thought these enemies would not be sufficient alone to disturb the empire, he contrived that the Burgundians, Franks, Vandals, and Alans, a northern people in search of new habitations, should assail the Roman provinces that they might be better able to avenge themselves for the injury that they had sustained, the Visigoths, on being deprived of their subsidy, created Alaric their king, and having assailed the empire, succeeded, after many reverses, in overrunning Italy, and finally in pillaging Rome. After this victory Alaric died, and his successor, Astolphus, having married Placidia, sister of the emperors, agreed with them to go to the relief of Gaul and Spain, which provinces had been assailed by the Vandals, Burgundians, Alans, and Franks, from the causes before mentioned. Hence it followed that the Vandals, who had occupied that part of Spain called Betica, now Andalusia, being pressed by the Visigoths and unable to resist them, were invited by Boniface, who governed Africa for the empire, to occupy that province, for, being in rebellion, he was afraid his heir would become known to the emperor. For these reasons the Vandals gladly undertook the enterprise, 
and under Genseric, their king, became lords of Africa. At this time Theodosius, son of Arcadius, succeeded to the empire, and bestowing little attention on the affairs of the West, caused those who had taken possession to think of securing their acquisitions. Thus the Vandals ruled Africa, the Alans and Visigoths Spain, while the Franks and Burgundians not only took Gaul, but each gave their name to the part they occupied. Hence one is called France, the other Burgundy. The good fortune of these people brought fresh people to the destruction of the empire, one of which, the Huns, occupied the province of Pannonia, situated upon the nearer shore of the Danube, and which, from their name, is still called Hungary. To these disorders it must be added that the emperor, seeing himself attacked on so many sides, to lessen the number of his enemies, began to treat first with the Vandals, then with the Franks, a course which diminished his own power and increased that of the barbarians. Nor was the island of Britain, which is now called England, secure from them, for the Britons, being apprehensive of those who had occupied Gaul, called the Angli, a people of Germany, to their aid, and these, under Wotergern, their king, first defended and then drove them from the island, of which they took possession, and after themselves named the country England. But the inhabitants, being robbed of their home, became desperate by necessity, and resolved to take possession of some other country, although they had been unable to defend their own. They therefore crossed the sea with their families, and settled in the country nearest to the beach, which from themselves is called Brittany. The Huns, who were said above to have occupied Pannonia, joining with other nations, such as the Zepidi, Eruli, Turingi, and Ostro, or Eastern Goths, moved in search of new countries, not being able to enter France, which was defended by the forces of the barbarians, came into Italy under Attila their king. He, a short time previously, in order to possess the entire monarchy, had murdered his brother Bleda, and having thus become very powerful, Anderek, king of the Zepidi, and Velimir, king of the Ostrogoths, became subject to him. Attila, having entered Italy, laid siege to Aquileia, where he remained without any obstacle for two years, wasting the country round and dispersing the inhabitants. This, as will be related in its place, calls the origin of Venice. After the taking and ruin of Aquileia, he directed his course towards Rome, from the destruction of which he abstained at the entreaty of the pontiff, his respect for whom was so great that he left Italy and retired into Austria, where he died. After the death of Attila, Velimir, king of the Ostrogoths, and the heads of the other nations, took arms against his son, Henry and Uric, slew the one and compelled the other, with his Huns, to repass the Danube and return to their country. While the Ostrogoths and Zepidi established themselves in Pannonia, and the Eruli and Turingi upon the further bank of the Danube, Attila, having left Italy, Valentinian, emperor of the west, thought of restoring the country, and that he might be more ready to defend it against the barbarians, abandoned Rome and removed the seat of the government to Ravenna. The misfortunes which befell the western empire caused the emperor, who resided at Constantinople, on many occasions to give up the possession of it to others, as a charge full of danger and expense, and sometimes without his permission, the Romans, seeing themselves so abandoned, created an emperor for their defense, or suffered some one to usurp their dominion. This occurred at the period of which we now speak, when Maximus, a Roman, after the death of Valentinian, seized the government, and compelled Eudocia, widow of the late emperor, to take him for her husband. But she, being of imperial blood, scorned the connection of a private citizen, and being anxious to avenge herself for the insult, secretly persuaded Genseric, king of the Vandals, and master of Africa, to come to Italy, representing to him the advantage that he would derive from the undertaking, and the facility with which it might be accomplished. Tempted by the hope of booty, he came immediately, and finding Rome abandoned, plundered the city during fourteen days. He also ravaged many other places in Italy, and then, loaded with wealth, withdrew to Africa. The Romans, having returned to their city, and Maximus being dead, elected Avitus, a Roman, as his successor. After this, several important events occurred, both in Italy and in the countries beyond, and after the deaths of many emperors, the empire of Constantinople devolved upon Zeno, and that of Rome upon Orestes and Augustulus, his son, 
who obtained the sovereignty by fraud. While they were designing to hold by force what they had obtained by treachery, the Arioli and Turingi, who, after the death of Attila, as before remarked, had established themselves upon the further banks of the Danube, united in a league and invaded Italy under Odoacer, their general. Into the districts which they left unoccupied, the Langobardi, or Langbards, also a northern people, entered, led by Godogo, their king. Odoacer conquered and slew Orestes near Pavia, but Augustulus escaped. After this victory, that Rome might, with her change of power, also change her title, Odoacer, instead of using the imperial name, caused himself to be declared King of Rome. He was the first of those leaders who, at this period, overran the world, and thought of settling in Italy. For the others, either from fear that they should not be able to hold the country, knowing that it might easily be relieved by the eastern emperors, or from some unknown cause, after plundering her, sought other countries wherein to establish themselves. End of Part 1, Chapter 1「Book One, Chapter Two of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book One, Chapter Two. State of the Roman Empire under Zeno. Theodoric, King of the Ostrogoths, Character of Theodoric, Changes in the Roman Empire, New Languages, New Names, Theodoric Dies, Belisarius in Italy, Totila Takes Rome, Narses Destroys the Goths, New Form of Government in Italy, Narses Invites the Lombards into Italy, The Lombards Change the Form of Government. At this time, the ancient Roman Empire was governed by the following princes. Zeno, reigning in Constantinople, commanded the whole of the Eastern Empire. The Ostrogoths ruled Messia and Pannonia. The Visigoths, Suevi and Alans, held Gascony and Spain. The Vandals, Africa. The Franks and Burgundians, France. And the Eruli and Turingi, Italy. The kingdom of the Ostrogoths had descended to Theodoric, nephew of Velimir, who, being on terms of friendship with Zeno, the eastern emperor, wrote to him that his Ostrogoths thought it an injustice that they, being superior in valor to the people thereabout, should be inferior to them in dominion, and that it was impossible for him to restrain them within the limits of Pannonia. So, seeing himself under the necessity of allowing them to take arms, and going in search of new abodes, he wished first to acquaint Zeno with it, in order that he might provide for them, by granting some country in which they might establish themselves, by his good favor, with greater propriety and convenience. Zeno, partly from fear, and partly from a desire to drive Odoacer out of Italy, gave Theodoric permission to lead his people against him, and take possession of the country. Leaving his friends, the Zepidae in Pannonia, Theodoric marched into Italy, slew Odoacer and his son, and moved by the same reason which had induced Valentinian to do so, established his court at Ravenna, and like Odoacer took the title of King of Italy. Theodoric possessed great talents both for war and peace. In the former he was always conqueror, and in the latter he conferred very great benefits upon the cities and people under him. He distributed the Ostrogoths over the country, each district under its leader, that he might more conveniently command them in war, and govern them in peace. He enlarged Ravenna, restored Rome, and with the exception of military discipline, conferred upon the Romans every honor. He kept within their proper bounds, wholly by the influence of his character, all the barbarian kings who occupied the empire. He built towns and fortresses between the point of the Adriatic and the Alps, in order, with greater facility, to impede the passage of any new hordes of barbarians who might design to assail Italy. And if, towards the latter end of his life, so many virtues had not been sullied by acts of cruelty, caused by various jealousies of his people, such as the death of Samachus and Boethius, men of great holiness. Every point of his character would have deserved the highest praise. By his virtue and goodness, not only Rome and Italy, 
but every part of the Western Empire, freed from the continual troubles which they had suffered from the frequent influx of barbarians, acquired new vigor, and began to live in an orderly and civilized manner. For surely if any times were truly miserable for Italy and the provinces overrun by barbarians, they were those which occurred from Arcadius and Honorius to Theodoric. If we only consider the evils which arise to a republic or a kingdom by a change of prince or of government, not by foreign interference, but by civil discord, in which we might see how even slight variations suffice to ruin the most powerful kingdoms or states, we may then easily imagine how much Italy and the other Roman provinces suffered, when they not only changed their form of government and their princes, but also their laws, customs, modes of living, religion, language, and name. Any one of these changes by itself, without being united with others, might, with thinking of it, to say nothing of the seeing and suffering, infuse terror into the strongest minds. From these causes proceeded the ruin as well as the origin and extension of many cities. Among those which were ruined were Aquileia, Luni, Chuisi, Popolonia, Fiesole, and many others. The new cities were Venice, Siena, Ferrara, Aquila, and other towns and castles which for brevity we omit. Those which were extended were Florence, Genoa, Pisa, Milan, Naples, and Bologna, to all of which may be added the ruin and restoration of Rome, and many other cities not previously mentioned. From this devastation and new population arose new languages, as we see in the different dialects of France, Spain, and Italy, which, partaking of the native idiom of the new people, and of the old Roman, formed a new manner of discourse. Besides, not only were the names of the provinces changed, but also of lakes, rivers, seas, and men. For France, Spain, and Italy are full of fresh names, wholly different from the ancient, and, as omitting many others, we see that the Po, the Guarda, and the Archipelago are names quite different from those which the ancients used, while instead of Caesar and Pompey, we have Peter, Matthew, John, etc. Among so many variations, that of religion was not of little importance. For, while combating the customs of the ancient faith with the miracles of the new, very serious troubles and discords were created among men. And if the Christians had been united in one faith, fewer disorders would have followed. But the contentions among themselves, of the churches of Rome, Greece, and Ravenna, joined to those of the heretic sects with the Catholics, served in many ways to render the world miserable. Africa is a proof of this, having suffered more horrors from the Arian sect, whose doctrines were believed by the Vandals, than from any avarice or natural cruelty of the people themselves. Living amid so many persecutions, the countenances of men bore witness of the terrible impressions upon their minds. For, besides the evils they suffered from the disordered state of the world, they scarcely could have recourse to the help of God, in whom the unhappy hope for relief, for the greater part of them, being uncertain what divinity they ought to address, died miserably, without help, and without hope. Having been the first who put a stop to so many evils, Theodoric deserves the highest praise, for during the thirty-eight years he reigned in Italy, he brought the country to such a state of greatness that her previous sufferings were no longer recognizable. But at his death the kingdom descended to Atalaric, son of Amalasantha, his daughter, and the malice of fortune, not being yet exhausted, the old evils soon returned, for Atalaric died soon after his grandfather, and the kingdom, coming into the possession of his mother, she was betrayed by Theodatus, whom she had called to assist her in the government. He put her to death and made himself king, and having thus become odious to the Ostrogoths, the emperor Justinian entertained the hope of driving him out of Italy. Justinian appointed Belisarius to the command of this expedition, as he had already conquered Africa, expelled the Vandals, and reduced the country to the imperial rule. Belisarius took possession of Sicily, and from thence, passing into Italy, occupied Naples and Rome. The Goths, seeing this, slew Theodatus their king, whom they considered the cause of their misfortune, and elected Vitiges in his stead, who, after some skirmishes, was besieged, and taken by Belisarius at Ravenna. But before he had time to secure the advantages of his victory, Belisarius was recalled by Justinian, and Johannes and Vitalis 
were appointed in his place. Their principles and practices were so different from those of Belisarius that the Goths took courage and created Iodovadus, governor of Verona, their king. After Iodovadus, who was slain, came Totila, who routed the imperial forces, took Tuscany and Naples, and recovered nearly the whole of what Belisarius had taken from them. On this account, Justinian determined to send him into Italy again, but coming only with a small force, he lost the reputation which his former victories had won for him, in less time than he had taken to acquire it. Totila, being at Ostia with his forces, took Rome before his eyes, but being unable to hold or to leave the city, he destroyed the greater part of it, drove out the citizens, and took the senators away with him. Thinking little of Belisarius, he led his people into Calabria to attack the force which had been sent from Greece. Belisarius, seeing the city abandoned, turned his mind to the performance of an honorable work. Viewing the ruins of Rome, he determined to rebuild her walls and recall her inhabitants with as little delay as possible. But fortune was opposed to this laudable enterprise, for Justinian, being at this time assailed by the Parthians, recalled him, and his duty to his sovereign compelled him to abandon Italy to Totila, who again took Rome, but did not treat her with such severity as upon the formal occasion. For at the entreaty of St. Benedict, who in those days had great reputation for sanctity, he endeavored to restore her. In the meantime, Justinian, having arranged matters with the Parthians, again thought of sending a force to the relief of Italy. But the Sclavi, another northern people, having crossed the Danube and attacked Illyria and Thrace, prevented him, so that Totila held almost the whole country. Having conquered the Slavonians, Justinian sent Narses, a eunuch, a man of great military talent, who, having arrived in Italy, routed and slew Totila. The Goths, who had escaped, sought refuge in Pavia, where they created Teus their king. On the other hand, Narses, after the victory, took Rome, and coming to an engagement with Teus near Nocera, slew him and routed his army. By this victory the power of the Goths in Italy was quite annihilated, after having existed for seventy years, from the coming of Theodoric to the death of Teus. No sooner was Italy delivered from the Goths than Justinian died, and was succeeded by Justin his son, who, at the instigation of Sophia his wife, recalled Narses and sent Longinus in his stead. Like those who preceded him, he made his abode at Ravenna, and besides this gave a new form to the government of Italy, for he did not appoint governors of the provinces as the Goths had done, but in every city and town of importance placed a ruler whom he called a duke. Neither in this arrangement did he respect Rome more than the other cities, for having set aside the consuls and the senate, names which up to this time had been preserved, he placed her under a duke, who was sent every year from Ravenna, and called her the Duchy of Rome, while to him who remained in Ravenna, and governed the whole of Italy for the emperor, was given the name of Exarch. This division of the country greatly facilitated the ruin of Italy, and gave the Lombards an early occasion of occupying it. Narses was greatly enraged with the emperor for having recalled him from the government of the province, which he had won with his own valor and blood, while Sophia, not content with the injury done by withdrawing him, treated him in the most offensive manner, saying she wished him to come back, that he might spin with the other eunuchs. Full of indignation, Narses persuaded Albion, king of the Lombards, who then reigned in Pannonia, to invade and take possession of Italy. The Lombards, as was said before, occupied those places upon the Danube which had been vacated by the Eruli and Turingi, when Odoacer their king led them into Italy, where, having been established for some time, their dominions were held by Albion, a man ferocious and bold, under whom they crossed the Danube, and coming to an engagement with Cunamund, king of the Zepidi, who held Pannonia, conquered and slew him. Albion, finding Rosamond, daughter of Cunamund, among the captives, took her to wife, and made himself sovereign of Pannonia, and, moved by his savage nature, caused the skull of Cunamond to be formed into a cup, from which, in memory of the victory, he drank. Being invited into Italy by Narses, with whom he had been in friendship during the war with the Goths, he left Pannonia to the Huns, 
who, after the death of Attila, had returned to their country. Finding on his arrival the province divided into so many parts, he presently occupied Pavia, Milan, Verona, Vicenza, and the whole of Tuscany, and the greater part of Flaminia, which is now called Remagna. These great and rapid acquisitions made him think the conquest of Italy already secured. He therefore gave a great feast of Verona, and, having become elevated with wine, ordered the skull of Cunamon to be filled, and caused it to be presented to the queen Rosamond, who sat opposite, saying loud enough for her to hear, that upon occasion of such great joy she should drink with her father. These words were like a dagger to the lady's bosom, and she resolved to have revenge. Knowing that Helcimus, a noble Lombard, was in love with one of her maids, she arranged with the young woman that Helmicus, without being acquainted with the fact, should sleep with her instead of his mistress. Having effected her design, Rosamond discovered herself to Helmicus, and gave him the choice of either killing Albion, and taking herself and the kingdom as his reward, or of being put to death as the ravisher of the king. Helmicus consented to destroy Albion, but after the murder, finding they could not occupy the kingdom, and fearful that the Lombards would put them to death for the love they bore to Albion, they seized the royal treasure, and fled with it to Longinus at Ravenna, who received them favorably. During these troubles the emperor Justinus died, and was succeeded by Tiberius, who, occupied in the wars with the Parthians, could not attend to the affairs of Italy, and this seeming to Longinus to present an opportunity, by means of Rosamond and her wealth, of becoming king of the Lombards, and of the whole of Italy, he communicated his design to her, persuaded her to destroy Helmicus, and to take him for her husband. To this end, having prepared poisoned wine, she with her own hand presented it to Helmicus, who complained of thirst, as he had come from the bath. Having drunk half of it, he suspected the truth, from the unusual sensation it occasioned, and compelled her to drink the remainder so that in a few hours both came to their end, and Longinus was deprived of the hope of becoming king. In the meantime the Lombards, having drawn themselves together in Pavia, which was become the principal seat of their empire, made Clephas their king. He rebuilt Emola, destroyed by Narses, and occupied Remini, and almost every place up to Rome, but he died in the course of his victories. Clephas was cruel to such a degree not only toward strangers, but to his own Lombards, that these people, sickened of royal power, did not create another king, but appointed among themselves thirty dukes to govern the rest. This prevented the Lombards from occupying the whole of Italy, or of extending their dominion further than Benevento. Four of the cities of Rome, Ravenna, Cremona, Mantua, Padua, Monselice, Parma, Bologna, Fainza, Forli, and Cessna, some defended themselves for a time, and others never fell under their dominion, since, not having a king, they became less prompt for war, and when they afterward appointed one, they were, by living in freedom, become less obedient, and more apt to quarrel among themselves, which from the first prevented a fortunate issue of their military expeditions, and this was the ultimate cause of their being driven out of Italy. The affairs of the Lombards, being in the state just described, the Romans and Longinus came to an agreement with them, that each should lay down their arms and enjoy what they already possessed. End of Part 1, Chapter 2For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown, Book 1, Chapter 3. Beginning of the Greatness of the Pontiffs in Italy, Abuse of Censors and Indulgences. The Pope applies to Pepin, King of France, for assistance. Donation of Pepin to the Pontiff. Charlemagne. End of the Kingdom of the Lombards. The title of Cardinal begins to be used. The Empire passes to the Germans. Berengarius, Duke of Fruili, created King of Italy. 
Pisa becomes great. Order and division of the states of Italy. Electors of the emperor created. In these times the popes began to acquire greater temporal authority than they had previously possessed. Although the immediate successors of St. Peter were more reverenced for the holiness of their lives, and the miracles which they performed, and their example so greatly extended the Christian religion, that princes of other states embraced it, in order to obviate the confusion which prevailed at that period. The emperor having become a Christian, and returned to Constantinople, it followed, as was remarked at the commencement of the book, that the Roman Empire was the more easily ruined, and the church more rapidly increased her authority. Nevertheless, the whole of Italy, being subject either to the emperors or the kings, till the coming of the Lombards, the Pope never acquired any greater authority than what reverence for their habits and doctrine gave them. In other respects they obeyed the emperors or kings, officiated for them in their affairs, as ministers or agents, and were even sometimes put to death by them. He who caused them to become of more importance in the affairs of Italy was Theodoric, king of the Goths, when he established the seat of his empire at Ravenna. For, Rome being without a prince, the Romans found it necessary for their safety to yield obedience to the Pope. His authority, however, was not greatly increased thereby, the only advantage being that the Church of Rome was allowed to take precedence of that of Ravenna. But the Lombards having taken possession, and Italy being divided into many parts, the Pope had an opportunity of greater exertion. Being, as it were, the head of Rome, both the Emperor of Constantinople and the Lombards respected him, so that the Romans, by his means, entered into league with the Lombards and with Longinus, not as subjects but as equals. Thus the Popes, at one time friends of the Greeks, and at another of the Lombards, increased their own power, but upon the ruin of the Eastern Empire, which occurred during the time of Heraclius, their influence was reduced, for the Sclavi, of whom we spoke before, again assailed Illyria, and having occupied the country, named it Sclavonia, after themselves. And the other parts were attacked by the Persians, then by the Saracens under Mohammed, and lastly by the Turks, who took Syria, Africa, and Egypt. These causes induced the reigning pope, in his distress, to seek new friends, and he applied to the king of France. Nearly all the wars with the northern barbarians carried on in Italy, it may be here remarked, were occasioned by the pontiffs, and the hordes with which the country was inundated were generally called in by them. The same mode of proceeding still continued, and kept Italy weak and unsettled. And therefore, in relating the events which have taken place from those times to the present, the ruin of the empire will be no longer illustrated, but only the increase of the pontificate and of the other principalities which ruled Italy till the coming of Charles VIII. It will be seen how the popes, first with censures and afterward with seas and arms, mingled with indulgences, became both terrible and venerable, and how, from having abused both, they ceased to possess any influence, and were wholly dependent on the will of others for assistance in their wars. But to return to the order of our narration, Gregory the Third occupied the papacy, and the kingdom of the Lombards was held by Astolpus, who, contrary to agreement, seized Ravenna and made war upon the Pope. On this account, Gregory no longer relying upon the Emperor of Constantinople, since he, for the reasons above given, was unable to assist him, and unwilling to trust the Lombards, for they had frequently broken their face, had recourse to Pepin II, who, from being Lord of Austria and Brabant, had become King of France, not so much by his own valor as by that of Charles Martel, his father, and Pepin his grandfather. For Charles Martel, being governor of the kingdom, effected the memorable defeat of the Saracens near Tours, upon the lawyer, in which, 
two hundred thousand of them are said to have been left dead upon the field of battle. Hence Pepin, by his father's reputation and his own abilities, became afterward king of France. To him Pope Gregory, as we have said, applied for assistance against the Lombards, which Pepin promised to grant, but desired first to see him and be honored with his presence. Gregory accordingly went to France, passing uninjured through the country of his enemies, so great was the respect they had for religion, and was treated honorably by Pepin, who sent an army into Italy and besieged the Lombards in Pavia. King Astolphus, compelled by necessity, made proposals of peace to the French, who agreed to them at the entreaty of the Pope, for he did not desire the death of his enemy, but that he should be converted and live. In this treaty Astolphus promised to give to the church all the places he had taken from her, but the king's forces having returned to France, he did not fulfill the agreement, and the Pope again had recourse to Pepin who sent another army, conquered the Lombards, took Ravenna, and contrary to the wishes of the Greek emperor, gave it to the Pope, with all the places that belonged to the exarchate, and added to them Urbino and the Marca. But Astolphus, while fulfilling the terms of his agreement, died, and Desiderius, a Lombard, who was Duke of Tuscany, took up arms to occupy the kingdom, and demanded assistance of the Pope, promising him his friendship. The Pope acceding to his request, the other princes ascended. Desiderius kept faith at first, and proceeded to resign the districts to the Pope, according to the agreement made with Pepin, so that an exarch was no longer sent from Constantinople to Ravenna, but it was governed according to the will of the Pope. Pepin soon after died, and was succeeded by his son Charles, the same who, on account of the magnitude and success of his enterprises, was called Charlemagne, or Charles the Great. Theodore I now succeeded to the papacy, and discord arising between him and Desiderius, the latter besieged him in Rome. The Pope requested assistance of Charles, who, having crossed the Alps, besieged Desiderius in Pavai, where he took both him and his children, and sent them prisoners to France. He then went to visit the pontiff at Rome, where he declared that the Pope, being vicar of God, could not be judged by men. The Pope and the people of Rome made him emperor, and thus Rome began to have an emperor of the West. And whereas the Popes used to be established by the emperors, the latter now began to have need of the popes at their elections. The empire continued to lose its powers, while the church acquired them, and by these means she constantly extended her authority over temporal princes. The Lombards, having now been two hundred and thirty-two years in the country, were strangers only in name, and Charles, wishing to reorganize the states of Italy, consented that they should occupy the places in which they had been brought up, and call the province after their own name, Lombardy. That they might be led to respect the Roman name, he ordered all that part of Italy adjoining to them, which had been under the exarchate of Ravenna, to be called Romagna. Besides this, he created his son Pepin, king of Italy, whose dominion extended to Benevento, all the rest being possessed by the Greek emperor, with whom Charles was in league. About this time, Pascal I occupied the pontificate, and the priests of the churches of Rome, from being near to the Pope and attending the elections of the pontiff, began to dignify their own power with a title, by calling themselves cardinals, and arrogated so great authority, that having excluded the people of Rome from the election of pontiff, the appointment of a new pope was scarcely ever made except from one of their own number. Thus, on the death of Pascal, the cardinal of St. Sabina was created pope by the title of Eugenius II. Italy having come into the hands of the French, a change of form and order took place, the popes acquiring greater temporal power, 
and the new authorities adopting the titles of count and marquis, as that of duke had been introduced by Longinus, exarch of Ravenna. After the death of some pontiffs, Osporco, a Roman, succeeded to the papacy, but on account of his unseemly appellation, he took the name of Sergius, and this was the origin of that change of names which the popes adapt upon their election to the pontificate. In the meantime, the Emperor Charles died, and was succeeded by Levis the Pious, after whose death so many disputes arose among his sons, that at the time of his grandchildren, the House of France lost the empire, which then came to the Germans, the first German emperor being called Arnolfus. Nor did the Carlovingian family lose the empire only. Their discords also occasioned them the loss of Italy, for the Lombards, gathering strength, offended the Pope and the Romans, and Arnolfo, not knowing where to seek relief, was compelled to create Berengarius, Duke of Ruili, King of Italy. These events induced the Huns, who occupied Pannonia, to assail Italy, but in an engagement with Berengarius they were compelled to return to Pannonia, which had from them been named Hungary. Romano was at this time Emperor of Greece, having, while prefect of the army, dethroned Constantine, and, as Puglia and Calabria, which, as before observed, were parts of the Greek Empire, had revolted, he gave permission to the Saracens to occupy them, and they, having taken possession of these provinces, besieged Rome. The Romans, Berengarius being then engaged in defending himself against the Huns, appointed Alberic, Duke of Tuscany, their leader. By his valor Rome was saved from the Saracens, who, withdrawing from the siege, erected a fortress upon Mount Gargano, by means of which they governed Puglia and Calabria, and harassed the whole country. Thus Italy was in those times very grievously afflicted, being in constant warfare with the Huns in the direction of the Alps, and, on the Neapolitan side, suffering from the inroads of the Saracens. The state of things continued many years, occupying the reigns of three Berengarii, who succeeded each other, and during this time the Pope and the Church were greatly disturbed, the impotence of the Eastern and the disunion which prevailed among the Western princes, leaving them without defense. The city of Genua, with all her territory upon the rivers, having been overrun by the Saracens, an impulse was thus given to the rising greatness of Pisa, in which city multitudes took refuge, who had been driven out of their own country. These events occurred in the year 931, when Otto, Duke of Saxony, the son of Henry and Matilda, a man of great prudence and reputation, being made emperor, the Pope Agapito begged that he would come into Italy and relieve him from the tyranny of the Berengari. The states of Italy were governed in this manner. Lombardy was under Berengarius III and Alfred his son. Tuscany and Romagna were governed by a deputy of the Western Emperor. Puglia and Calabria were partly under the Greek Emperor and partly under the Saracens. In Rome, two consuls were annually chosen from the nobility, who governed her according to ancient custom. To these was added a prefect, who dispensed justice among the people, and there was a council of twelve, who each year appointed rectors for the places subject to them. The popes had more or less authority in Rome and the rest of Italy, in proportion as they were favorites of the emperor or of the most powerful states. The emperor Otto came into Italy, took the kingdom from the Berengari, in which they had reigned fifty-five years, and reinstated the pontiff in his dignity. He had a son and a nephew, each named Otto, who, one after the other, succeeded to the empire. In the reign of Otto III, Pope Gregory V was expelled by the Romans, whereupon the emperor came into Italy and replaced him, and the pope, to revenge himself on the Romans, took from them the right to create an emperor, and gave it to three princes and three bishops of Germany, 
the princes of Brandenburg, Palatine, and Saxony, and the bishops of Magonza, Treveri, and Colonia. This occurred in the year 1002. After the death of Otto III, the electors created Henry, Duke of Bavaria, emperor, who at the end of twelve years was crowned by Pope Stephen VIII. Henry and his wife Simeonda were persons of very holy life, as is seen by the many temples built and endowed by them, of which the church of St. Miniato near Florence is one. Henry died in 1024, and was succeeded by Conrad of Suabia, and the latter by Henry II, who came to Rome. And as there was a schism in the church of three popes, he set them all aside, and caused the election of Clement II, by whom he was crowned emperor. End of Book One, Chapter Three Book One, Chapter Four of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy. Volume One by Niccolo Machiavelli. Translator and known. Book One, Chapter Four. Nicholas the Second commits the election of the Pope to the Cardinals. First example of a prince deprived of his dominions by the Pope. Guelphs and Ghibellines. Establishment of the Kingdom of Naples. Pope Urban the Second goes to France. The First Crusade. New Orders of Knighthood. Saladin takes from the Christians their possessions in the East. Death of the Countess Matilda. Character of Frederick Barbarossa. Schism. Frederick creates an antipope. Building of Alexandria in Puglia. Disgraceful conditions imposed by the Pope upon Henry, King of England. Reconciliation of Frederick with the Pope. The Kingdom of Naples passes to the Germans. Orders of St. Dominic and St. Francis. Italy was at this time governed, partly by the people, some districts by their own princes, and others by the deputies of the emperor. The highest in authority, and to whom the others referred, was called the Chancellor. Of the princes, the most powerful were Gottfried and the Countess Matilda, his wife, who was daughter of Beatrice, the sister of Henry II. She and her husband possessed Lucca, Parma, Reggio, Mantua, and the whole of what is now called the patrimony of the church. The ambition of the Roman people caused many wars between them and the pontiffs, whose authority had previously been used to free them from the emperors. But when they had taken the government of the city to themselves, and regulated it according to their own pleasure, they at once became at enmity with the popes, who received far more injuries from them than from any Christian potentate. And while the popes caused all the West to tremble with their censures, the people of Rome were in open rebellion against them, nor had they or the popes any other purpose but to deprive each other of reputation and authority. Nicholas II now attained the papacy, and as Gregor V had taken from the Romans the right to create an emperor, he in the same manner determined to deprive them of their share in the election of the Pope, and confine the creation to the cardinals alone. Nor did this satisfy him, for, having agreed with the princes who governed Calabria and Puglia, with methods which we shall presently relate, he compelled the officers whom the Romans appointed to their different jurisdictions to render obedience to him and some of them he even deprived of their offices. Up to the death of Nicholas there was a schism in the church. The clergy of Lombardy refused obedience to Alexander II, created at Rome, and elected Cadolo of Parma antipope, and Henry, who hated the power of the pontiffs, gave Alexander to understand that he must renounce the pontificate, and ordered the cardinals to go into Germany, 
to appoint a new pope. He was the first who felt the importance of spiritual weapons, for the pope called a council at Rome, and deprived Henry of both the empire and the kingdom. Some of the people of Italy took the part of the pope, others of Henry, and hence arose the factions of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, that Italy, relieved from the inundations of barbarians, might be distracted with intestine strife. Henry, being excommunicated, was compelled by his people to come into Italy, and fall barefooted upon his knees before the Pope, and ask his pardon. This occurred in the year 1084. Nevertheless, there shortly afterward arose new discords between the Pope and Henry, upon which the Pope again excommunicated him, and the Emperor sent his son, also named Henry, with an army to Rome, and he, with the assistance of the Romans, who hated the Pope, besieged him in the fortress. Robert Guiscard then came from Puglia to his relief, but Henry had left before his arrival, and returned to Germany. The Romans stood out alone, and the city was sacked by Robert, and reduced to ruins. As from this Robert sprung the establishment of the kingdom of Naples, it seems not superfluous to relate, particularly his actions and origin. Disunion having arisen among the descendants of Charlemagne, occasion was given to another northern people, called Normans, to assail France and occupy that portion of the country which is now named Normandy. A part of these people came into Italy, at the time when the province was infested with the Berengari, the Saracens, and the Huns, and occupied some places in Romagna, where, during the wars of that period, they conducted themselves valiantly. Tancred, one of these Norman princes, had many children. Among the rest were William, surnamed Ferebach, and Robert, called Giscard. When the principality was governed by William, the troubles of Italy were in some measure abated, but the Saracens still held Sicily, and plundered the coast of Italy daily. On this account William arranged with the princes of Capua and Salerno, and with Melorco, a Greek, who governed Puglia and Calabria for the Greek emperor, to attack Sicily, and it was agreed that, if they were victorious, each should have a fourth part of the booty and the territory. They were fortunate in their enterprise, expelled the Saracens, and took possession of the island. But, after the victory, Melorco secretly caused forces to be brought from Greece, seized Sicily in the name of the emperor, and appropriated the booty to himself and his followers. William was much dissatisfied with this, but reserved the exhibition of his displeasure for a suitable opportunity, and left Sicily with the princes of Salerno and Capua. But when they had parted from him to return to their homes, instead of proceeding to Romagna, he led his people towards Puglia, and took Melfi, and from thence, in a short time, recovered from the Greek emperor almost the whole of Puglia and Calabria, over which provinces, in the time of Pope Nicholas II, his brother Robert Giscard was sovereign. Robert, having had many disputes with his nephews for the inheritance of these states, requested the influence of the Pope to settle them, which His Holiness was very willing to afford, being anxious to make a friend of Robert, to defend himself against the Emperor of Germany and the insolence of the Roman people, which indeed shortly followed, when, at the instance of Gregory, he drove Henry from Rome, and subdued the people. Robert was succeeded by his sons, Roger and William, to whose dominion not only was Naples added, but all the places interjacent as far as Rome, and afterwards Sicily, of which Roger became sovereign. But upon William going to Constantinople, to marry the daughter of the emperor, his dominions were wrested from him by his brother Roger. Inflated with so great an acquisition, Roger first took the title of King of Italy, but afterward contended himself with that of King of Puglia and Sicily. He was the first who established and gave the name to this kingdom, which still retains its ancient boundaries, although its sovereigns have been of many families and countries. Upon the failure of the Normans it came to the Germans, 
after these to the French, then to the Aragonese, and is now held by the Flemish. About this time, Urban the Second became Pope, and excited the hatred of the Romans. As he did not think himself safe even in Italy, on account of the disunion which prevailed, he directed his thoughts to a generous enterprise. With his whole clergy, he went into France, and at Anvers, having drawn together a vast multitude of people, delivered an oration against the infidels, which so excited the minds of his audience, that they determined to undertake the conquest of Asia from the Saracens, which enterprise with all those of a similar nature were afterward called crusades, because the people who joined in them bore upon their armor and apparel the figure of a cross. The leaders were Godfrey, Eustace, and Baldwin of Bouillon, Counts of Boulogne, and Peter, a hermit celebrated for his prudence and sagacity. Many kings and people joined them, and contributed money, and many private persons fought under them at their own expense. So great was the influence of religion in those days upon the minds of men, excited by the example of those who were its principal ministers. The proudest successes attended the beginning of this enterprise, for the whole of Asia Minor, Syria, and part of Egypt fell under the power of the Christians. To commemorate these events, the Order of the Knights of Jerusalem was created, which still continues, and holds the island of Rhodes, the only obstacle to the power of the Mohammedans. The same events gave rise to the Order of the Knights Templars, which, after a short time, on account of their shameless practices, was dissolved. Various fortunes attended the crusaders in the course of their enterprises, and many nations and individuals became celebrated accordingly. The kings of France and England joined them, and, with the Venetians, Pisans, and Genoese, acquired great reputation, till the time of Saladin, when, by whose talents, and the disagreement of the Christians among themselves, the crusaders were robbed of all that glory which they had at first acquired, and, after ninety years, were driven from those places which they had so honorably and happily recovered. After the death of Urban, Pascal II became Pope, and the empire was under the dominion of Henry IV, who came to Rome, pretending friendship for the pontiff, but afterward put his holiness and all his clergy in prison nor did he release them till it was conceded that he should dispose of the churches of Germany, according to his own pleasure. About this time the Countess Matilda died, and made the church heir to all her territories. After the deaths of Pascal and Henry IV, many popes and emperors followed, till the papacy was occupied by Alexander III, and the empire by Frederick, surnamed Barbarossa. The popes during this period had met with many difficulties from the people of Rome and the emperors, and in the time of Barbarossa they were much increased. Frederick possessed military talent, but was so full of pride that he would not submit to the pontiff. However, at his election to the empire he came to Rome to be crowned, and returned peaceably to Germany, where he did not long remain in the same mind, but came again into Italy to subdue certain places in Lombardy, which did not obey him. It happened at this time that the Cardinal St. Clement, of a Roman family, separated from Alexander, and was made Pope by some of the Cardinals. The Emperor Frederick, being encamped at Zerma, Alexander complained to him of the anti-Pope, and received for answer that they were both to go to him, and, having heard each side, he would determine which was the true pope. This reply displeased Alexander, and, as he saw the emperor was inclined to favor the antipope, he excommunicated him, and then fled to Philip, king of France. Frederick, in the meantime, carrying on the war in Lombardy, destroyed Milan, which caused the union of Verona, Padua, and Vicenza against him for their common defense. About the same period the antipope died, and Frederick set up Guido of Cremona in his stead. The Romans, 
from the absence of the Pope and from the Emperor being in Lombardy, had reacquired some authority in Rome, and proceeded to recover the obedience of those places which had been subject to them. And as the people of Tusculum refused to submit to their authority, they proceeded against them with their whole force, but these, being assisted by Frederick, routed the Roman army with such dreadful slaughter that Rome was never after either so populous or so rich. Alexander now returned to the city, thinking he could be safe there on account of the enmity subsisting between the Romans and the Emperor, and from the enemies which the latter had in Lombardy. But Frederick, setting aside every other consideration, led his forces and encamped before Rome, and Alexander fled to William, king of Puglia, who had become heir of that kingdom after the death of Roger. Frederick, however, withdrew from Rome on account of the plague which then prevailed, and returned to Germany. The cities of Lombardy in league against him, in order to command Pavia and Tortona, which adhered to the imperial party, built a city to be their magazine in time of war, and named it Alexandria, in honor of the Pope and in contempt of Frederick. Guido the Antipope died, and Giovanni of Perma was appointed in his stead, who, being favored by the imperialists, lived at Montefiascone. Pope Alexander being at Tusculum, whither he had been called by the inhabitants, that with his authority he might defend them from the Romans, ambassadors came to him from Henry, king of England, to signify that he was not blamable for the death of Thomas a Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, although public report had slandered him with it. On this the Pope sent two cardinals to England, to inquire into the truth of the matter, and although they found no actual charge against the king, still, on account of the infamy of the crime, and for not having honoured the archbishop so much as he deserved, the sentence against the king of England was, that having called together the barons of his empire, he should upon oath before them affirm his innocence, that he should immediately send two hundred soldiers to Jerusalem, paid for one year, that, before the end of three years he should himself proceed thither, with as large an army as he could draw together, that his subjects should have the power of appealing to Rome when they thought proper, and that he should annul whatever acts had been passed in his kingdom, unfavorable to ecclesiastical rule. These terms were all accepted by Henry, and thus a great king submitted to a sentence that in our day a private person would have been ashamed of. But while the Pope exercised so great authority over distant princes, he could not compel obedience from the Romans themselves, or obtain their consent that he should remain in Rome, even though he promised to intermeddle only with ecclesiastical affairs. About this time Frederick returned to Italy, and while he was preparing to carry on new wars against the Pope, his prelates and barons declared that they would abandon him unless he reconciled himself with the church, so that he was obliged to go and submit to the Pope of Venus, where a pacification was effected, but in which the Pope deprived the Emperor of all authority over Rome, and named William King of Sicily and Puglia, a coadjutor with him. Frederick, unable to exist without war, joined the crusaders in Asia, that he might exercise that ambition against Mohammed, which he could not gratify against the vicars of Christ. And being near the river Kidnus, tempted by the clearness of its waters, bathed therein, took cold, and died. Thus the river did a greater favor to the Mohammedans than the Pope's excommunications had done to the Christians, for the latter only checked his pride, while the former finished his career. Frederick being dead, the Pope had now only to suppress the contumacy of the Romans, and, after many disputes concerning the creation of consuls, it was agreed that they should elect them as they had been accustomed to do, but that these should not undertake the office till they had first sworn to be faithful to the Church. This agreement being made, Giovanni the Antipope took refuge in Mount Albano, 
where he shortly afterward died. William, king of Naples, died about the same time, and the Pope intended to occupy that kingdom on the ground that the king had left only a natural son named Tancred. But the barons would not consent, and wished that Tancred should be king. Celestine the Third, the then Pope, anxious to snatch the kingdom from the hands of Tancred, contrived that Henry, son of Frederick, should be elected emperor, and promised him the kingdom on the condition that he should restore to the church all the places that had belonged to her. To facilitate this affair, he caused Gostanza, a daughter of William, who had been placed in a monastery and was now old, to be brought from her seclusion and become the wife of Henry. Thus the kingdom of Naples passed from the Normans, who had been the founders of it, to the Germans. As soon as the affairs of Germany were arranged, the Emperor Henry came into Italy with Gostanza his wife, and a son about four years of age, named Frederick. And, as Tancred was now dead, leaving only an infant named Roger, he took possession of the kingdom without much difficulty. After some years Henry died in Sicily, and was succeeded in the kingdom by Frederick, and in the empire by Otho, Duke of Saxony, who was elected through the influence of Innocent the Third. But as soon as he had taken the crown, contrary to the general expectation, he became an enemy of the Pope, occupied Romagna, and prepared to attack the kingdom. On this account the Pope excommunicated him. He was abandoned by every one, and the electors appointed Frederick, King of Naples, emperor in his stead. Frederick came to Rome for his coronation, but the Pope, being afraid of his power, would not crown him, and endeavored to withdraw him from Italy, as he had done also. Frederick returned to Germany in anger, and after many battles with Otho, at length conquered him. Meanwhile Innocent died, who, besides other excellent works, built the Hospital of the Holy Ghost at Rome. He was succeeded by Honorius the Third, in whose time the religious orders of St. Dominic and St. Francis were founded. 1218. Honorius crowned Frederick, to whom Giovanni, descended from Baldwin, king of Jerusalem, who commanded the remainder of the Christian army in Asia, and still held that title, gave a daughter in marriage, and with her portion conceded to him the title to that kingdom. Hence it is that every king of Naples is called King of Jerusalem. End of Book 1, Chapter 4「Book One, Chapter Five, of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator and Known. Book One, Chapter Five. THE STATE OF ITALY, BEGINNING OF THE GREATNESS OF THE HOUSE OF ESTE, GELFS AND GIBELINS, DEATH OF THE EMPEROR FREDERICK II, MANFRED TAKES POSSESSION OF THE KINGDOM OF NAPLES, MOVEMENTS OF THE GELFS AND GIBELINS IN LOMBARDY, CHARLES OF ANJOU INVESTED BY THE POPE WITH THE KINGDOM OF NAPLES AND SICILY, RESTLESS POLICY OF THE POPES, AMBITIOUS VIEWS OF POPE NICHOLAS III, NEPHEWS OF THE POPES, Sicilian Vespers. The Emperor Rodolph allows many cities to purchase their independence. Institution of the Jubilee. The Popes at Avignon. At this time the states of Italy were governed in the following manner. The Romans no longer elected consuls, but instead of them, and with the same powers, they appointed one senator, and sometimes more. The league which the cities of Lombardy had formed against Frederick Barbarossa still continued, and comprehended Milan, Brescia, Mantua, and the greater number of the cities of Romagna, together with Verona, Vicenza, Padua, and Trevisa. Those which took part with the emperor were Cremona, Bergamo, Parma, Reggio, and Trento. The other cities and fortresses of Lombardy 
Romagna and the march of Trevisa favored, according to their necessities, sometimes one party, sometimes the other. In the time of Otho the Third, there had come into Italy a man called Ezzelin, who, remaining in the country, had a son, and he too had a son named Ezzelin. This person, being rich and powerful, took part with Frederick, who, as we have said, was at enmity with the Pope. Frederick, at the instigation and with the assistance of Ezzelin, took Verona and Mantua, destroyed Vicenza, occupied Padua, routed the army of the United Cities, and then directed his course towards Tuscany. Ezzelin, in the meantime, had subdued the whole of the Trevisian march, but could not prevail against Ferrara, which was defended by Azone de Este, and the forces which the Pope had in Lombardy. And as the enemy were compelled to withdraw, the Pope gave Ferrara in fee to this Azone, from whom are descended those who now govern that city. Frederick halted at Pisa, desirous of making himself lord of Tuscany, but, while endeavouring to discover what friends and foes he had in that province, he scattered so many seeds of discord as occasioned the ruin of Italy, for the factions of the Guelphs and Ghibellines multiplied, those who supported the church taking the name of Guelphs, while the followers of the emperor were called Ghibellines, these names being first heard at Pistoia. Frederick, marching from Pisa, assailed and wasted the territories of the church in a variety of ways, so that the Pope, having no other remedy, unfurled against him the banner of the cross, as his predecessor had done against the Saracens. Frederick, that he might be suddenly abandoned by his people, as Frederick Barbarossa and others had been, took into his pay a number of Saracens, and to bind them to him, and established in Italy a firm bulwark against the church, without fear of papal maledictions, he gave them Nocera in the kingdom of Naples, that, having a refuge of their own, they might be placed in greater security. The pontificate was now occupied by Innocent IV, who, being in fear of Frederick, went to Genoa, and thence to France, where he appointed a council to be held at Lyons, where it was the intention of Frederick to attend, but he was prevented by the rebellion of Parma, and being repulsed, he went into Tuscany, and from thence to Sicily, where he died, leaving his son Conrad in Swabia, and in Puglia Manfred, whom he had created Duke of Benevento, born of a concubine. Conrad came to take possession of the kingdom, and having arrived at Naples, died, leaving an infant son named Corradino, who was then in Germany. On this account Manfred occupied the state, first as guardian of Corradino, but afterward, causing a report to be circulated that Corradino had died, made himself king, contrary to the wishes of both the Pope and the Neapolitans, who, however, were obliged to submit. While these things were occurring in the kingdom of Naples, many movements took place in Lombardy between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. The Guelphs were headed by a legate of the Pope, and the Ghibelline party by Ezelin, who possessed nearly the whole of Lombardy beyond the Po, and, as in the course of the war Padua rebelled, he put to death twelve thousand of its citizens. But before its close he himself was slain, in the eightieth year of his age, and all the places he had held became free. Manfred, king of Naples, continued those enmities against the church, which had been begun by his ancestors, and kept the pope, Urban IV, in continual alarm, so that, in order to subdue him, Urban summoned the crusaders, and went to Perugia to await their arrival. Seeing them few and slow in their approach, he found that more able assistance was necessary to conquer Manfred. He therefore sought the favor of France, created Louis of Anjou, the king's brother, sovereign of Naples and Sicily, and excited him to come into Italy to take possession of that kingdom. But before Charles came to Rome, the Pope died, and was succeeded by Clement IV, in whose time he arrived at Ostia, with thirty galleys, and ordered that the rest of his forces should come by land. During his abode at Rome, the citizens, in order to attach him to them, made him their senator, and the Pope invested him with the kingdom, on condition 
that he should pay annually to the church the sum of fifty thousand ducats, and it was decreed that, from henceforth, neither Charles nor any other person who might be king of Naples should be emperor also. Charles marched against Manfred, routed the army, and slew him near Benevento, and then became sovereign of Sicily and Naples. Corradino, to whom, by his father's will, the state belonged, having collected a great force in Germany, marched into Italy against Charles, with whom he came to an engagement at Tagliacozzo, was taken prisoner while endeavouring to escape, and being unknown, put to death. Italy remained in repose until the pontificate of Adrian V. Charles, being at Rome, and governing the city by virtue of his office of senator, the Pope, unable to endure his power, withdrew to Viterbo, and solicited the Emperor Rodolph to come into Italy and assist him. Thus the popes, sometimes in zeal for religion, at others moved by their own ambition, were continually calling in new parties and exciting new disturbances. As soon as they had made a prince powerful, they viewed him with jealousy and sought his ruin, and never allowed another to rule the country, which, from their own imbecility, they were themselves unable to govern. Princes were in fear of them, for, fighting or running away, the popes always obtained the advantage, unless it happened they were entrapped by deceit, as occurred to Boniface the Eighth, and some others, who under pretense of friendship were ensnared by the emperors. Rodolph did not come into Italy, being detained by the war in which he was engaged with the king of Bohemia. At this time Adrian died, and Nicholas III of the Orsini family became pontiff. He was a bold, ambitious man, and being resolved at any event to diminish the power of Charles, induced the emperor Rodolph to complain that he had a governor in Tuscany, favorable to the Gothic faction, who after the death of Manfred had been replaced by him. Charles yielded to the emperor and withdrew his governor, and the pope sent one of his nephews, a cardinal, as governor for the emperor, who, for the honor done him, restored Romagna to the church, which had been taken from her by his predecessors, and the pope made Bertoldo Orsini duke of Romagna. As Nicholas now thought himself powerful enough, to oppose Charles, he deprived him of the office of senator, and made a decree that no one of royal race should ever be a senator in Rome. It was his intention to deprive Charles of Sicily, and to this end he entered into a secret negotiation with Peter, king of Aragon, which took effect in the following papacy. He also had the design of creating two kings out of his family, the one in Lombardy, the other in Tuscany whose power would defend the church from the Germans, who might design to come into Italy, and from the French, who were in the kingdom of Naples and Sicily. But with these thoughts he died. He was the first pope who openly exhibited his own ambition, and under pretense of making the church great, conferred honors and emolument upon his own family. Previous to this time no mention is made of the nephews or families of any pontiff, but future history is full of them, nor is there now anything left for them to attempt, except the effort to make the papacy hereditary. True it is, the princes of their creating have not long sustained their honors, for the pontiffs, being generally of very limited existence, did not get their plans properly established. To Nicholas succeeded Martin IV, of French origin, and consequently favorable to the party of Charles, who sent him assistance against the rebellion of Romagna, and while they were encamped at Furli, Guido Bonatto, an astrologer, contrived that at an appointed moment the people should assail the forces of the king, and the plan succeeding, all the French were taken and slain. About this period was also carried into effect the plot of Pope Nicholas and Peter, king of Aragon, by which the Sicilians murdered all the French that were in that island, and Peter made himself sovereign of it, saying that it belonged to him in the right of his wife Gostanza, daughter of Manfred. But Charles, while making warlike preparations for the recovery of Sicily, died, leaving a son, Charles II, 
who was made prisoner in Sicily, and to recover his liberty promised to return to his prison, if within three years he did not obtain the Pope's consent that the kings of Aragon should be invested with the kingdom of Sicily. The Emperor Rodolph, instead of coming into Italy, gave the empire the advantage of having done so, by sending an ambassador with authority to make all those cities free which would redeem themselves with money. Many purchased their freedom, and with liberty changed their mode of living. Adolfo of Saxony succeeded to the empire, and to the papacy Pietro del Morone, who took the name of Celestino. But being a hermit and full of sanctity, after six months renounced the pontificate, and Boniface the Eighth was elected. After a time the French and Germans left Italy, and the country remained wholly in the hands of the Italians. But Providence ordained that the Pope, when these enemies were withdrawn, should neither establish nor enjoy his authority, and raise two very powerful families in Rome, the Colonnesi and the Orsini, who with their arms, and the proximity of their abode, kept the pontificate weak. Boniface then determined to destroy the Colonnesi, and, besides excommunicating, endeavored to direct the weapons of the church against them. This, although it did them some injury, proved more disastrous to the Pope, for those arms which from attachment to the face were formed valiantly against its enemies, as soon as they were directed against Christians for private ambition, ceased to do the will of those who wished to wield them. And thus the too eager desire to gratify themselves caused the pontiffs by degrees to lose their military power. Besides what is just related, the Pope deprived two cardinals of the Colonnesi family of their office, and Schiara, the head of the house, escaping unknown, was taken by corsairs of Catalonia and put to the oar. But being afterward recognized at Marcellus, he was sent to Philip, king of France, who had been excommunicated and deprived of the kingdom. Philip, considering that in a war against the pontiff he would either be a loser or run great hazards, had recourse to deception, and simulating a wish to come to terms, secretly sent Schiara into Italy, who, having arrived at Anagnia, where his holiness then resided, assembled a few friends, and in the night took him prisoner. And although the people of Anagnia set him at liberty shortly after, yet from grief at the injury he died mad. Boniface was the founder of the Jubilee in 1300, and fixed that it should be celebrated at each revolution of one hundred years. In those times various troubles arose between the Guelf and Ghibelline factions, and the emperors, having abandoned Italy, many places became free, and many were occupied by tyrants. Pope Benedict restored the scarlet hat to the cardinals of the Colonnesi family, and reblessed Philip, king of France. He was succeeded by Clement V, who, being a Frenchman, removed the papal court to Avignon in 1305. End of chapter 5「Book One, Chapter Six of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book One, Chapter Six. The Emperor Henry comes into Italy. The Florentines take the part of the Pope. The Visconti originate the Duchy of Milan. Artifice of Maffeo Visconti against the family of Della Torre. Giovanni Galeazzo Visconti, first Duke of Milan. The Emperor Louis in Italy. John, King of Bohemia in Italy. League against the King of Bohemia and the Pope's legate. Origin of Venice. Liberty of the Venetians, confirmed by Pepin and the Greek Emperor. Greatness of Venice. Decline of Venice. Discord between the Pope and the Emperor. Giovanna, Queen of Naples. Rienzi. 
the jubilee reduced to fifty years. Succession of the Duke of Milan. Cardinal Egidio, the Pope's legate. War between the Genoese and the Venetians. At this time, Charles II of Naples died, and was succeeded by his son Robert. Henry of Luxembourg had been elected to the empire, and came to Rome for his coronation, although the Pope was not there. His coming occasioned great excitement in Lombardy, for he sent all the banished to their homes, whether they were Guelphs or Ghibellines, and in consequence of this, one faction endeavouring to drive out the other, the whole province was filled with war, nor could the emperor with all his endeavours abate its fury. Leaving Lombardy by way of Genoa, he came to Pisa, where he endeavoured to take Tuscany from King Robert, but not being successful he went to Rome, where he remained only a few days, being driven away by the Orsini with the consent of King Robert, and returned to Pisa, and that he might more securely make war upon Tuscany, and wrest the country from the hands of the king, he caused it to be assailed by Frederick, monarch of Sicily. But when he was in hope of occupying Tuscany, and robbing the king of Naples of his dominions, he died, and was succeeded by Louis of Bavaria. About the same period, John the Twenty Second attained the papacy, during whose time the emperor still continued to persecute the Guelphs and the church, but they were defended by Robert and the Florentines. Many wars took place in Lombardy between the Visconti and the Guelphs, and in Tuscany between Castruccio of Lucca and the Florentines. As the family of the Visconti gave rise to the Duchy of Milan, one of the five principalities which afterward governed Italy, I shall speak of them from a rather earlier date. Milan, upon recovering from the ruin into which she had been thrown by Frederick Barbarossa, in revenge for her injuries, joined the league formed by the Lombard cities for their common defence. This restrained him, and for a while preserved alive the interests of the church in Lombardy. In the course of the wars which followed, the family of La Torre became very potent in that city, and their reputation increased so long as the emperor possessed little authority in the province. But Frederick the Second coming into Italy, and the Ghibelline party, by the influence of Ezelin having grown powerful, seeds of the same faction sprang up in all the cities. In Milan were the Visconti, who expelled the La Torres. These, however, did not remain out, for by agreement between the emperor and the pope, they were restored to their country. For when the pope and his court removed to France, and the emperor, Henry of Luxembourg, came into Italy, with the pretext of going to Rome for his crown, he was received in Milan by Maffeo Visconti and Guido della Torre, who were then the heads of these families. But Maffeo, designing to make use of the emperor for the purpose of expelling Guido, and thinking the enterprise not difficult, on account of the La Torre being of the contrary faction to the imperial, took occasion, from the remarks which the people made of the uncivil behavior of the Germans, to go craftily about and excite the populace to arm themselves, and throw off the yoke of these barbarians. When a suitable moment arrived, he caused a person in whom he confided to create a tumult, upon which the people took arms against the Germans. But no sooner was the mischief well on foot that Maffeo, with his sons and their partisans, ran to Henry, telling him that all the disturbance had been occasioned by the La Torre family, who, not content to remain peaceably in Milan, had taken the opportunity to plunder him, that they might ingratiate themselves with the Guelphs in Italy, and become princes in the city. They then bade him be of good cheer, for they, with their party, whenever he wished it, were ready to defend him with their lives. Henry, Believing all that Maffeo told him, joined his forces to those of the Visconti, and, attacking the La Torre, who were in various parts of the city, endeavouring to quell the tumult, slew all upon whom they could lay hands, and having plundered the others of their property, sent them into exile. By this artifice Maffeo Visconti became a prince of Milan. Of him remained Galeazzo and Azzo, and after these Lucino and Giovanni, 
Giovanni became Archbishop of Milan, and of Lucino, who died before him, were left Bernabo and Galeazzo. Galeazzo, dying soon after, left a son, called the Count of Virtu, who, after the death of the Archbishop, contrived the murder of his uncle, Bernabo, became Prince of Milan, and was the first who had the title of Duke. The Duke left Filippo and Giovan Maria Angelo, the latter of whom being slain by the people of Milan, the state fell to Filippo. But he, having no male heir, Milan passed from the family of Visconti to that of Sforza, in the manner to be related hereafter. But to return to the point from which we deviated. The Emperor Louis, to add to the importance of his party, and to receive the crown, came into Italy, and being at Milan as an excuse for taking money of the Milanese, he pretended to make them free, and to put the Visconti in prison. But shortly afterwards he released them, and having gone to Rome, in order to disturb Italy with less difficulty, he made Piero della Corvara, antipope, by whose influence and the power of the Visconti he designed to weaken the opposite faction in Tuscany and Lombardy. But Castruccio died, and his death caused the failure of the emperor's purpose, for Pisa and Luca rebelled. The Pisans sent Piero della Corvara a prisoner to the Pope in France, and the emperor, despairing of the affairs of Italy, returned to Germany. He had scarcely left before John, king of Bohemia, came into the country at the request of the Ghibellines of Brescia, and made himself lord of that city and of Bergamo. And as his entry was with the consent of the Pope, although he feigned the contrary, the legate of Bologna favoured him, thinking by this means to prevent the return of the Emperor. This caused a change in the parties of Italy, for the Florentines and King Robert, finding the legate was favourable to the enterprises of the Ghibellines, became foes of all those, to whom the legate and the King of Bohemia were friendly. Without having regard for either faction, whether Gelf or Ghibelline, many princes joined them, of whom among others were the Visconti, the Della Scala, Filippo Gonzao of Mantua, the Carrara, and those of Este. Upon this the Pope excommunicated them all. The King, in fear of the League, went to collect forces in his own country, and having returned with a large army, still found his undertaking a difficult one. So, seeing his error, he withdrew to Bohemia, to the great displeasure of the legate, leaving only Reggio and Modena guarded, and Parma in the care of Marsilio and Piero de Rossi, who were the most powerful men in the city. The king of Bohemia being gone, Bologna joined the league, and the leaguers divided among themselves the four cities which remained of the church faction. They agreed that Parma should pertain to the Della Scala. Reggio to the Gonzaga, Modena to the family of Este, and Luca to the Florentines. But in taking possession of these cities, many disputes arose, which were afterward in a great measure settled by the Venetians. Some perhaps will think it a species of impropriety that we have so long deferred speaking of the Venetians, theirs being a republic, which, both on account of its power and internal regulations, deserves to be celebrated above any principality of Italy. But thus this surprise may cease when the cause is known. I shall speak of their city from a more remote period, that every one may understand what were their beginnings, and the causes which so long withheld them from interfering in the affairs of Italy. When Attila, king of the Huns, besieged Achillea, the inhabitants, after defending themselves a long time, began to despair of effecting their safety, and fled for refuge to several uninhabited rocks, situated at the point of the Adriatic Sea, now called the Gulf of Venice, carrying with them whatever movable property they possessed. The people of Padua, finding themselves in equal danger, and knowing that, having become master of Aquileia, Attila would next attack themselves, also removed with their most valuable property, to a place on the same sea, called Rivo Alto, to which they brought their women, children, and aged persons, leaving the youth in Padua to assist in her defence. Besides these, the people of Omanselitz, with the inhabitants of the surrounding hills, 
driven by similar fears, fled to the same rocks. But after Attila had taken Aquileia, and destroyed Padua, Monsilitz, Vicenza, and Verona, the people of Padua and others who were powerful, continued to inhabit the marshes about Rivo Alto, and, in like manner, all the people of the province anciently called Venetia, driven by the same events, became collected in these marshes. Thus, under the pressure of necessity, they left an agreeable and fertile country to occupy one sterile and unwholesome. However, in consequence of a great number of people being drawn together into a comparatively small space, in a short time they made those places not only habitable, but delightful, and having established among themselves laws and useful regulations, enjoyed themselves in security amid the devastations of Italy, and soon increased both in reputation and strength. For, besides the inhabitants already mentioned, many fled to these places from the cities of Lombardy, principally to escape from the cruelties of Clefis, king of the Lombards, which greatly tended to increase the numbers of the new city, and in the conventions which were made between Pepin, king of France, and the emperor of Greece, when the former, at the entreaty of the Pope, came to drive the Lombards out of Italy, the Duke of Benevento and the Venetians did not render obedience to either the one or the other, but alone enjoyed their liberty. As necessity had led them to dwell on sterile rocks, they were compelled to seek the means of subsistence elsewhere, and voyaging with their ships to every port of the ocean, their city became a depository for the various products of the world, and was itself filled with men of every nation. For many years the Venetians sought no other dominion than that which tended to facilitate their commercial enterprises, and thus acquired many ports in Greece and Syria, and as the French had made frequent use of their ships in voyages to Asia, the island of Candia was assigned to them in recompense for these services. While they lived in this manner, their name spread terror over the seas, and was held in veneration throughout Italy. This was so completely the case, that they were generally chosen to arbitrate in controversies between the states, as occurred in the difference between the colleagues, on account of the cities they had divided among themselves, which being referred to the Venetians, they awarded Brescia and Bergamo to the Visconti. But when in the course of time, urged by their eagerness for dominion, they had made themselves masters of Padua, Vicenza, Trevisa, and afterward of Verona, Bergamo and Brescia, with many cities in Romagna and the kingdom of Naples, other nations were impressed with such an opinion of their power, that they were a terror, not only to the princes of Italy, but to the ultramontane kings. These states entered into an alliance against them, and in one day wrested from them the provinces they had obtained, with so much labor and expense. And although they have in latter times reacquired some portions, still possessing neither power nor reputation, like all the other Italian powers, they live at the mercy of others. Benedict the Twelfth, having attained the pontificate and finding Italy lost, fearing, too, that the emperor would assume the sovereignty of the country, determined to make friends of all who had usurped the government of those cities, which had been accustomed to obey the emperor, that they might have occasion to dread the latter, and unite with himself in the defense of Italy. To this end he issued a decree, confirming to all the tyrants of Lombardy the places they had seized. After making this concession the Pope died, and was succeeded by Clement VI. The emperor, seeing with what a liberal hand the pontiff had bestowed the dominions of the empire, in order to be equally bountiful with the property of others, gave to all who had assumed sovereignty over the cities or territories of the church the imperial authority to retain possession of them. By this means Galeotto Malatesti and his brothers became lords of Rimino, Pesaro and Fano, Antonio da Montefeltro of the Marca and Urbino, Gentile de Varano of Camerino, Guido di Polenta of Ravenna, Sinibaldo or de Laffi of Furli and Cesena, Giovanni Manfredi of Faenza, 
Lodovico Alidossi of Imola, and besides these many others in diverse places. Thus, of all the cities, towns, or fortresses of the church, few remained without a prince, for she did not recover herself till the time of Alexander the Sixth, who, by the ruin of the descendants of these princes, restored the authority to the church. The emperor, when he made the concession before named, being at Tarento, signified an intention of going into Italy. In consequence of this, many battles were fought in Lombardy, and the Visconti became lords of Parma. Robert, king of Naples, now died, leaving only two grandchildren, the issue of his son Charles, who had died a considerable time before him. He ordered that the elder of the two, whose name was Giovanna, or John, should be heiress of the kingdom, and take for her husband Andrea, son of the king of Hungary, his grandson. Andrea had not lived with her long, before she caused him to be murdered, and married another cousin, Louis, prince of Tarento. But Louis, king of Hungary, and brother of Andrea, in order to avenge his death, brought forces into Italy, and drove Queen John and her husband out of the kingdom. At this period a memorable circumstance took place in Rome. Niccolo di Lorenzo, often called Rienzi or Cola di Rienzi, who held the office of Chancellor at Campidoglio, drove the senators from Rome, and, under the title of Tribune, made himself the head of the Roman Republic, restoring it to its ancient form, and with so great reputation of justice and virtue, that not only the places adjacent, but the whole of Italy sent ambassadors to him. The ancient provinces, seeing Rome arise to new life, again raised their heads, and some induced by hope, others by fear, honored him as their sovereign. But Niccolo, notwithstanding his great reputation, lost all energy in the very beginning of his enterprise, and as if oppressed with the weight of so vast an undertaking, without being driven away, secretly fled to Charles, king of Bohemia, who, by the influence of the Pope, and in contempt of Louis of Bavaria, had been elected emperor. Charles, to ingratiate himself with the pontiff, sent Niccolo to him, a prisoner. After some time, in imitation of Rienzi, Francesco Baroncegli seized upon the tribunate of Rome, and expelled the senators, and the Pope, as the most effectual means of repressing him, drew Niccolo from his prison, sent him to Rome, and restored to him the office of tribune, so that he reoccupied the state, and put Francesco to death. But the Colonnesi becoming his enemies, he too, after a short time, shared the same fate, and the senators were again restored to their office. The king of Hungary, having driven out Queen John, returned to his kingdom, but the Pope, who chose to have the queen in the neighborhood of Rome rather than the king, effected her restoration to the sovereignty, on the condition that her husband, contending himself with the title of Prince of Tarento, should not be called king. Being the year 1350, the Pope thought that the jubilee appointed by Boniface the Eighth to take place at the conclusion of each century might be renewed at the end of each fifty years, and having issued a decree for the establishment of it, the Romans, in acknowledgment of the benefit, consented that he should send four cardinals to reform the government of the city, and appoint senators according to his own pleasure. The Pope again declared Louis of Tarento king, and in gratitude for the benefit, Queen Joan gave Avignon her inheritance to the church. About this time Lucino Visconti died, and his brother, the Archbishop, remaining Lord of Milan, carried on many wars against Tuscany and his neighbors, and became very powerful. Bernabo and Galeazzo, his nephews, succeeded him, but Galeazzo soon after died, leaving Giovan Galeazzo, who shared the state with Bernabo. Charles, King of Bohemia, was then emperor, and the pontificate was occupied by Innocent VI, who sent Cardinal Egidio, a Spaniard, into Italy. He restored the reputation of the Church, not only in Rome and Romagna, but throughout the whole of Italy. He recovered Bologna from the Archbishop of Milan, 
and compelled the Romans to accept a foreign senator appointed annually by the Pope. He made honorable terms with the Visconti, and routed and took prisoner John Agut, an Englishman, who, with four thousand English, had fought on the side of the Ghibellins in Tuscany. Urban V, hearing of so many victories, resolved to visit Italy and Rome, whither also the emperor came. After remaining a few months, he returned to the kingdom of Bohemia, and the pope to Avignon. On the death of Urban, Gregory the Eleventh was created pope, and, as the cardinal Egidio was dead, Italy again recommenced her ancient discords, occasioned by the union of the other powers against the Visconti, and the Pope, having first sent a legate with six thousand Bretons, came in person and established the papal court at Rome in 1376, after an absence of seventy-one years in France. To Gregory the Eleventh succeeded Urban the Sixth, but shortly afterwards Clement the Sixth was elected at Fondi by ten cardinals, who declared the appointment of Urban irregular. At this time the Genoese threw off the yoke of the Visconti, under whom they had lived many years, and between them and the Venetians several important battles were fought for the island of Tenedos. Although the Genoese were for a time successful, and held Venice in a state of siege during many months, the Venetians were at length victorious, and by the intervention of the Pope, peace was made in the year 1381. In these wars artillery was first used, having been recently invented by the Dutch. End of chapter 6 Book 1 Chapter 7 of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator and Known. Book 1, Chapter 7. Schism in the Church, Ambitious Views of Giovanni Galeazzo Visconti, The Pope and the Romans Come to an Agreement, Boniface the Ninth Introduces the Practice of Annets, Disturbance in Lombardy, The Venetians Acquire Dominion on Terra Firma, Differences between the Pope and the People of Rome, Council of Pisa, Council of Constance, Filippo Visconti Recovers His Dominion, Giovanna the Second of Naples, Political Condition of Italy. A schism having thus arisen in the Church, Queen Joan favored the schismatic Pope, upon which Urban caused Charles of Durazzo, descended from the kings of Naples, to undertake the conquest of her dominions. Having succeeded in his object, she fled to France, and he assumed the sovereignty. The king of France, being exasperated, sent Louis of Anjou into Italy to recover the kingdom for the queen, to expel Urban from Rome and establish the antipope. But in the midst of this enterprise Louis died, and his people being rooted returned to France. In this conjuncture the pope went to Naples, where he put nine cardinals into prison for having taken the part of France and the antipope. He then became offended with the king, for having refused to make his nephew Prince of Capua, and pretending not to care about it, requested he would grant him Nocera for his capitation. But, having fortified it, he prepared to deprive the king of his dominions. Upon this the king pitched his camp before the place, and the pope fled to Naples, where he put to death the cardinals whom he had imprisoned. From thence he proceeded to Rome, and, to acquire influence, created twenty-nine cardinals. At this time Charles, king of Naples, went to Hungary, where, having been made king, he was shortly afterward killed in battle, leaving a wife and two children at Naples. About the same time Giovanni Galeazzo Visconti murdered Bernabo, his uncle, and took the entire sovereignty upon himself, and, not content with being Duke of Milan and sovereign of the whole of Lombardy, designed to make himself master of Tuscany, 
but while he was intent upon occupying the province with the ultimate view of making himself king of Italy, he died. Boniface the Ninth succeeded Urban the Sixth. The antipope Clement the Sixth also died, and Benedict the Thirteenth was appointed his successor. Many English, Germans, and Bretons served at this period in the armies of Italy, commanded partly by those leaders who had from time to time authority in the country, and partly by such as the pontiffs sent when they were at Avignon. With these warriors the princes of Italy long carried on their wars, till the coming of Lodovico de Cento of Romagna, who formed a body of Italian soldiery, called the Company of St. George, whose valor and discipline soon caused the foreign troops to fall into disrepute, and gave reputation to the native forces of the country, of which the princes afterward availed themselves in their wars with each other. The Pope, Boniface IX, being at enmity with the Romans, went to Scesi, where he remained till the jubilee of, 14, of 1400, when the Romans, to induce him to return to the city, consented to receive another foreign senator of his appointing, and also allowed him to fortify the castle of St. Angelo, having returned upon these conditions, in order to enrich the church, he ordained that every one, upon vacating a benefice, should pay a year's value of it to the apostolic chamber. After the death of Giovanni Galeazzo, Duke of Milan, although he left two children, Giovanni Maria and Filippo, the state was divided into many parts, and in the troubles which ensued, Giovanni Maria was slain. Filippo remained some time in the castle of Pavia, from which, through the fidelity and virtue of the castellan, he escaped. Among others who occupied cities possessed by his father was Gaglielmo della Scala, who, being banished, fell into the hands of Francesco de Carrera, lord of Padua, by whose means he recovered the state of Verona, in which he only remained a short time, for he was poisoned by order of Francesco, and the city taken from him. These things occasioned the people of Vicenza, who had lived in security under the protection of the Visconti, to dread the greatness of the lord of Padua, and they placed themselves under the Venetians, who, engaging in arms with him, first took Verona, and then Padua. At this time Pope Boniface died, and was succeeded by Innocent the Seventh. The people of Rome supplicated him to restore to them their fortresses and their liberty. But as he would not consent to their petition, they called to their assistance Ladislaus, king of Naples. Becoming reconciled to the people, the Pope returned to Rome, and made his nephew Lodovico count of La Marca. Innocent soon after died, and Gregory the Twelfth was created, upon the understanding to renounce the papacy whenever the antipope would also renounce it. By the advice of the cardinals in order to attempt the reunion of the church, Benedict the antipope came to Porto Venere and Gregory to Lucca, where they made many endeavors, but effected nothing. Upon this the cardinals of both the popes abandoned them, Benedict going to Spain and Gregory to Rimini. On the other hand, the cardinals, with the favor of Balthazar Cossa, cardinal and legate of Bologna, appointed a council at Pisa, where they created Alexander V, who immediately excommunicated King Ladislaus and invested Louis of Anjou with the kingdom. This prince, with the Florentines, Genoese, and Venetians, attacked Ladislaus and drove him from Rome. In the head of the war, Alexander died and Balthazar Cossa succeeded him, with the title of John XXIII. Leaving Bologna, where he was elected, he went to Rome, and found there Louis of Anjou, who had brought the army from Provence, and coming to an engagement with Ladislaus, routed him. But by the mismanagement of the leaders, they were unable to prosecute the victory, so that the king in a short time gathered strength and retook Rome. Louis fled to Provence, the Pope to Bologna, where, considering how he might diminish the power of Ladislaus, he caused Sigismund, King of Hungary, to be elected Emperor, and advised him to come to Italy. Having a personal interview at Mantua, they agreed to call a general council, 
in which the church should be united, and having effected this, the Pope thought he should be fully enabled to oppose the forces of his enemies. At this time there were three popes, Gregory, Benedict, and Giovanni, which kept the church weak and in disrepute. The city of Constance in Germany was appointed for the holding of the council, contrary to the expectation of Pope John, and although the death of Ladislaus had removed the cause which induced the Pope to call the council, still, having promised to attend, he could not refuse to go there. In a few months after his arrival at Constance, he discovered his error, but it was too late. Endeavoring to escape, he was taken, put in prison, and compelled to renounce the papacy. Gregory, one of the antipopes, sent his renunciation. Benedict, the other, refusing to do the same, was condemned as a heretic. But being abandoned by his cardinals, he complied, and the council elected Odo, of the Colonnesi family, pope, by the title of Martin V. Thus the church was united under one head, after having been divided by many pontiffs. Filippo Visconti was, as we have said, in the fortress of Pavia, but Vazzino Cain, who in the affairs of Lombardy had become lord of Vercelli, Alessandria, Novara, and Tortona, and had amazed great riches, finding his end approach, and having no children, left his wife Beatrice, heiress of his estates, and arranged with his friends that a marriage should be effected between her and Filippo. By this union Filippo became powerful, and reacquired Milan and the whole of Lombardy. By way of being grateful for these numerous favors, as princes commonly are, he accused Beatrice of adultery, and caused her to be put to death. Finding himself now possessed of greater power, he began to think of warring with Tuscany, and of prosecuting the designs of Giovanni Galeazzo, his father. Ladislaus, king of Naples, at his death, left to his sister Giovanna the kingdom and a large army, under the command of the principal leaders of Italy, among the first of whom was Forza of Contignola, reputed by the soldiery of that period to be a very valiant man. The queen, to shun the disgrace of having kept about her person a certain Pandolfello, whom she had brought up, took for her husband Jacopo della Marca, a Frenchman of the royal line, on the condition that he should be content to be called Prince of Tarento, and leave to her the title and government of the kingdom. But the soldiery, upon his arrival in Naples, proclaimed him king, so that between the husband and the wife wars ensued. And although they contended with varying success, the queen at length obtained the superiority, and became an enemy of the pope. Upon this, in order to reduce her to necessity, and that she might be compelled to throw herself into his lap, Sforza suddenly withdrew from her service without giving her any previous notice of his intention to do so. She thus found herself at once unarmed, and not having any other source, sought the assistance of Alfonso, king of Aragon, and Sicily, adopted him as her son, and engaged Braccio of Mantone as her captain who was of equal reputation in arms with Sforza, and inimical to the Pope, on account of his having taken possession of Perugia and some other places belonging to the Church. After this, peace was made between the Queen and the Pontiff, but King Alfonso, expecting she would treat him as she had her husband, endeavoured secretly to make himself master of the strongholds. But, possessing acute observation, she was beforehand with him, and fortified herself in the castle of Naples. Suspicions increasing between them, they had recourse to arms, and the queen, with the assistance of Sforza, who again resumed the, her service, drove Alfonso out of Naples, deprived him of his succession, and adopted Louis of Anjou in his stead. Hence arose new contests between Braccio, who took the part of Alfonso, and Sforza, who defended the cause of the queen. In the course of the war, Sforza was drowned in endeavouring to pass the river Pescara. The queen was thus again unarmed, and would have been driven out of the kingdom, but for the assistance of Filippo Visconti, the Duke of Milan, who compelled Alfonso to return to Aragon. Braccio, 
and daunted at the departure of Alfonso, continued the enterprise against the queen, and besieged Aquila, but the pope, thinking the greatness of Braccio injurious to the church, received into his pay Francesco, the son of Sforza, who went in pursuit of Braccio to Ul Aquila, where he rooted and slew him. Of Braccio remained Odo, his son, from whom the pope took Perugia, and left him the state of Montone alone, but he was shortly afterwards slain in Romagna, in the service of the Florentines, so that of those who had fought under Braccio, Niccolo Piccino remained of greatest reputation. Having continued our general narration nearly to the period which we at first proposed to reach, what remains is of little importance except the war which the Florentines and Venetians carried on against Filippo, Duke of Milan, of which an account will be given when we speak particularly of Roland. When we speak particularly of Florence, I shall therefore continue it no further, briefly explaining the condition of Italy in respect of her princes and her arms at the period to which we have now come. John the Second held Naples, La Marca, the Patrimony, and Romagna. Some of these places obeyed the Church while others were held by vicars or tyrants, as Ferrara, Modena, and Reggio, by those of the house of Este, Faenza, by the Manfredi, Imola by the Alidossi, Furli by the Ordelaffi, Rimini and Psaro by the Malitasti, and Camerino by those of Varano. Part of Lombardy was subject to the Duke Filippo, part to the Venetians, for all those who had held single states were set aside, except the house of Gonzaga, which ruled in Mantua. The greater part of Tuscany was subject to the Florentines. Lucca and Siena alone were governed by their own laws. Lucca was under the Junigi, Siena was free. The Genoese, being sometimes free, at others subject to the kings of France or the Visconti, lived unrespected, and may be enumerated among the minor powers. None of the principal states were armed with their own proper forces. Duke Filippo kept himself shut up in his apartments, and would not allow himself to be seen. His wars were managed by commissaries. The Venetians, when they directed their attention to terra firma, threw off those arms which had made them terrible upon the seas, and falling into the customs of Italy, submitted their forces to the direction of others. The practice of arms being unsuitable to priests or women, the Pope and Queen John of Naples were compelled by necessity to submit to the same system which others practiced from defect of judgment. The Florentines also adopted the same custom, for having, by their frequent divisions, destroyed the nobility, and their republic being wholly in the hands of men brought up to trade, they followed the usages and example of others. Thus the arms of Italy were either in the hands of the lesser princes, or of men who possessed no state, for the minor princes did not adopt the practice of arms from any desire of glory, but for the acquisition of either property or safety. The others, those who possessed no state, being bred to arms from their infancy, were acquainted with no other art, and pursued war for emolument, or to confer honor upon themselves. The most noticed among the latter were Carmignola, Francesco Sforza, Niccolo Piccinino, the pupil of Braccio, Agnolo della Pergola, Lorenzo di Micheletto, Attenduli, Il Tartaglia, Giazzo Paccio, Cezzolini di Perugia, Niccolo da Tolentino, Guido Torello, Antonia dal Ponte ad Era, and many others. With these were those lords of whom I have before spoken, to which may be added the barons of Rome, the Colonesi and the Orsini, with other lords and gentlemen of the kingdoms of Naples and Lombardy, who, being constantly in arms, had such an understanding among themselves, and so contrived to accommodate things to their own convenience, that of those who were at war, most commonly both sides were losers, and they had made the practice of arms so totally ridiculous, that the most ordinary leader, possessed of true valor, would have covered these men with disgrace, whom, with so little prudence, Italy honored. 
With these idle princes and such contemptible arms, my history must, therefore, be filled, to which before I descend it will be necessary, as was at first proposed, to speak of the origin of Florence, that it might be clearly understood what was the state of the city in those times, and by what means, through the labors of a thousand years, she became so imbecile. End of chapter 7 Book 2, Chapter 1 of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Book 2, Chapter 1. The custom of ancient republics to plant colonies, and the advantage of it. Increased population tends to make countries more healthy. Origin of Florence. Aggrandizement of Florence. Origin of the name of Florence. Destruction of Florence by Totila. The Florentines take Fiesole. The first division in Florence and the cause of it. Bondelmonti. Bondelmonti slain, Guelphs and Ghibellines in Florence, Guelphic families, Ghibelline families, the two factions come to terms. Among the great and wonderful institutions of the republics and principalities of antiquity that have now gone into this use was that by means of which towns and cities were from time to time established and there is nothing more worthy the attention of a great prince, or of a well-regulated republic, or that confers so many advantages upon a province, as the settlement of new places, where men are drawn together for mutual accommodation and defense. This may easily be done by sending people to reside in recently acquired or uninhabited countries. Besides causing the establishment of new cities, these removals render a conquered country more secure and keep the inhabitants of a province properly distributed. Thus, deriving the greatest attainable comfort, the inhabitants increase rapidly, are more prompt to attack others, and defend themselves with greater assurance. This custom, by the unwise practice of princes and republics, having gone into desuetude, the ruin and weaknesses of territories has followed. For this ordination is that by which alone empires are made secure, and countries become populated. Safety is the result of it, because the colony which a prince establishes in a newly acquired country is like a fortress and a guard, to keep the inhabitants in fidelity and obedience. Neither can a province be wholly occupied and preserve a proper distribution of its inhabitants without this regulation, for all districts are not equally healthy, and hence some will abound to overflowing, while others are void. And if there be no method of withdrawing them from places in which they increase too rapidly, and planting them where they are too few, the country would soon be wasted. For one part would become a desert, and the other a dense and wretched population. And as nature cannot repair this disorder, it is necessary that industry should effect it, for unhealthy localities become wholesome when a numerous population is brought into them. With cultivation the earth becomes fruitful, and the air is purified with fires, remedies which nature cannot provide. The city of Venice proves the correctness of these remarks. Being placed in a marshy and unwholesome situation, it became healthy only by the number of industrious individuals who were drawn together. Pisa, too, on account of its unwholesome air, was never filled with inhabitants, till the Saracens, having destroyed Genoa and rendered her rivers unnavigable, caused the Genoese to migrate thither in vast numbers, and thus render her populous and powerful. Where the use of colonies is not adopted, 
conquered countries are held with great difficulty districts once uninhabited still remain so and those which populate quickly are not relieved hence it is that many places of the world and particularly in italy in comparison of ancient times have become deserts this has wholly arisen and proceeded from the negligence of princes who have lost all appetite for true glory and of republics which no longer possess institutions that deserve praise in ancient times by means of colonies new cities frequently arose and those already begun were enlarged as was the case with florence which had its beginning from fiesole and its increase from colonies it is exceedingly probable as dante and giovanni villani show that the city of fiesole being situate upon the summit of the mountain in order that her markets might be more frequented and afford greater accommodation for those who brought merchandise would appoint the place in which to hold them not upon the hill but in the plain between the foot of the mountain and the river arno i imagine these markets to have occasioned the first erections that were made in those places and to have induced merchants to wish for commodious warehouses for the reception of their goods and which in time became substantial buildings and afterward when the romans having conquered the carthaginians rendered italy secure from foreign invasion these buildings would greatly increase for men never endure inconveniences unless some powerful necessity compels them thus although the fear of war induces a willingness to occupy places strong and difficult of access as soon as the cause of alarm is removed men gladly resort to more convenient and easily attainable localities hence the security to which the reputation of the roman republic gave birth caused the inhabitants having begun in the manner described to increase so much as to form a town this was at first called the villa arnina after this occurred the civil wars between marius and sylla then those of caesar and pompey and next those of the murderers of caesar and the parties who undertook to avenge his death therefore first by sylla and after by the three roman citizens who having avenged the death of caesar divided the empire among themselves colonies were sent to fiesole which either in part or in whole fixed their habitations in the plain near to the then rising town by this increase the place became so filled with dwellings that it might with propriety be enumerated among the cities of italy there are various opinions concerning the derivation of the word florentia some suppose it to come from florinus one of the principal persons of the colony others think it was originally not florentia but fluentia as supposed the word derived from fluente or flowing of the arno and in support of their opinion adduce a passage from pliny who says the fluentini are near the flowing of the arno this however may be incorrect for pliny speaks of the locality of the florentini not of the name by which they were known and it seems as if the word fluentini were a corruption because frontinus and cornelius tacitus who wrote at nearly the same period as pliny call them florentia and florentini for in the time of tiberius they were governed like the other cities of italy besides cornelius refers to the coming of ambassadors from the florentines to beg of the emperor that the waters of the chiane might not be allowed to overflow their country and it is not at all reasonable that the city should have two names at the same time therefore i think that however derived the name was always florentia and that whatever the origin might be it occurred under the roman empire and began to be noticed by writers in the times of the first emperors when the roman empire was afflicted by the barbarians florence was destroyed by totila king of the ostrogoths 
and after a period of two hundred and fifty years rebuilt by charlemagne from whose time till the year twelve fifteen she participated in the fortune of the rest of italy and during this period first the descendants of charles then the berengari and lastly the german emperors governed her as in our general treaties we have shown nor could the florentines during those ages increase in numbers or effect anything worthy of memory on account of the influence of those to whom they were subject nevertheless in the year ten ten upon the feast of st romolo a solemn day with the fiesolani they took and destroyed fiesole which must have been performed either with the consent of the emperors or during the interim from the death of one to the creation of his successor when all assumed a larger share of liberty but then the pontiffs acquired greater influence and the authority of the german emperors was in its wane all the places of italy governed themselves with less respect for the prince so that in the time of henry the third the mind of the country was divided between the emperor and the church however the florentines kept themselves united until the year twelve fifteen rendering obedience to the ruling power and anxious only to preserve their own safety but as the diseases which attack our bodies are more dangerous and mortal in proportion as they are delayed so florence though late to take part in the sects of italy was afterward the more afflicted by them the cause of her first division is well known having been recorded by dante and many other writers i shall however briefly notice it among the most powerful families of florence were the buondelmonti and the uberti next to these were the amidei and the donati of the donati family there was a rich widow who had a daughter of exquisite beauty for whom in her own mind she had fixed upon buondelmonti a young gentleman the head of the buondelmonti family as her husband but either from negligence or because she thought it might be accomplished at any time she had not made known her intention when it happened that the cavalier bethrowed himself to a maiden of the amidei family this grieved the donati widow exceedingly but she hoped with her daughter's beauty to disturb the arrangement before the celebration of the marriage and from an upper apartment seeing buondelmonti approach her house alone she descended and as she was passing she said to him i am glad to learn you have chosen a wife although i had reserved my daughter for you and pushing the door open presented her to his view the cavalier seeing the beauty of the girl which was very uncommon and considering the nobility of her blood and her portion not being inferior to that of the lady whom he had chosen became inflamed with such an ardent desire to possess her that not thinking of the promise given or the injury he committed in breaking it or of the evils which his breach of faith might bring upon himself said since you have reserved her for me i should be very ungrateful indeed to refuse her being yet at liberty to choose and without any delay married her as soon as the fact became known the amidei and the uberti whose families were allied were filled with rage and having assembled with many others connections of the parties they concluded that the injury could not be tolerated without disgrace and that the only vengeance proportionate to the enormity of the offence would be to put buondelmonti to death and although some took into consideration the evils that might ensue upon it mosca lamberti said that those who talk of many things effect nothing using that trite and common adage cosa fatta capo a thereupon they appointed to the execution of the murder mosca himself stiatti uberti lambertuccio amidei and oderigo fifanti 
who on the morning of easter day concealed themselves in a house of the amide situate between the old bridge and st stephen's and as Bondelmonte was passing upon a white horse thinking it as easy a matter to forget an injury as reject an alliance he was attacked by them at the foot of the bridge and slain close by a statue of mars this murder divided the whole city one party espousing the cause of the Bondelmonti, the other that of the Uberti. And as these families possessed men and means of defense, they contended with each other for many years without one being able to destroy the other. Florence continued in these troubles till the time of Frederick the Second, who, being king of Naples, endeavored to strengthen himself against the church, and to give greater stability to his power in Tuscany, favored the uberti and their followers who with his assistance expelled the bondelmonti thus our city as all the rest of italy had long time been became divided into guelphs and ghibellines and as it will not be superfluous i shall record the names of the families which took part with each faction those who adopted the cause of the guelphs were the bondelmonti Nerli, Rossi, Frescobaldi, Mozzi, Bardi, Pulci, Gerardini, Foraboschi, Bagnesi, Guidalotti, Sacchetti, Manieri, Lucardesi, Chiaramontesi, Compiobessi, Cavalcanti, Giandonati, Gianfigliazzi, Scali, Gualterotti, Importuni, Bostichi, Tornaquinci, Vecchietti, Tosigni, Ariguzzi, Agli, Sisi, Adimari, Visdomini, Donati, Passi, Della Bella, Ardinghi, Tedaldi, Cerchi. Of the Ghibelline faction were the Uberti, Manelli, Ubriachi, Fifanti, Amidei, Infangati, Malespini, Scolari, Guidi, Galli, Cappiardi, Lamberti, Soldanieri, Cipriani, Toschi, Amieri, Palermini, Migliorelli, Pigli, Barucci, Cattani, Agolanti, Brunelleschi, Caponsacchi, Elisei, Abati, Tidaldini, Giuochi, and Galigai. Besides the noble families on each side above enumerated, each party was joined by many of the higher ranks of the people, so that the whole city was corrupted with this division. The Guelphs, being expelled, took refuge in the upper Val d'Arno where part of their castles and strongholds were situated, and where they strengthened and fortified themselves against the attacks of their enemies. But, upon the death of Frederick, the most unbiased men, and those who had the greatest authority with the people, considered that it would be better to effect the reunion of the city than by keeping her divided, cause her ruin. They therefore induced the Guelphs to forget their injuries and return, and the Ghibellines to lay aside their jealousies and receive them with cordiality. End of Book Two, Chapter One. Book Two, Chapter Two of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book 2, Chapter 2. New Form of Government in Florence. Military Establishments. The Greatness of Florence. Movements of the Ghibellines. Ghibellines driven out of the city, Guelphs routed by the forces of the King of Naples, Florence in the power of the King of Naples, 
project of the Ghibellines to destroy Florence opposed by Farinata degli Uberti, Adventures of the Guelphs of Florence, The Pope gives his standard to the Guelphs, Fears of the Ghibellines and their preparations for the defense of their power, Establishment of trades companies and their authority, Count Guido Novello expelled, he goes to Prato, the Guelphs restored to the city, the Pope endeavors to restore the Ghibellines and excommunicates Florence, Pope Nicholas III endeavors to abate the power of Charles, King of Naples. Being united, the Florentines thought the time favorable for the ordination of a free government, and that it would be desirable to provide their means of defense before the new emperor should acquire strength. They therefore divided the city into six parts, and elected twelve citizens, two for each sixth, to govern the whole. These were called Anziani, and were elected annually. To remove the cause of those enmities which had been observed to arise from judicial decisions, they provided two judges from some other state, one called Captain of the People, the other Podesta, or Provost, whose duty it was to decide in cases, whether civil or criminal, which occurred among the people. And as order cannot be preserved without a sufficient force for the defence of it, they appointed twenty banners in the city, and seventy-six in the country, upon the rolls of which the names of all the youth were armed, and it was ordered that every one should appear armed, under his banner, whenever summoned, whether by the captain of the people, or the Anziani. They had ensigns according to the kind of arms they used, the bowmen being under one ensign, and the swordsmen, or those who carried a target, under another and every year, upon the day of Pentecost, ensigns were given with great pomp to the new men, and new leaders were appointed for the whole establishment. To give importance to their armies, and to serve as a point of refuge for those who were exhausted in the fight, and from which, having become refreshed, they might again make head against the enemy, they provided a large car, drawn by two oxen, covered with red cloth, upon which was an ensign of white and red. When they intended to assemble the army, this car was brought into the new market, and delivered with pomp to the heads of the people. To give solemnity to their enterprises, they had a bell, called Martinella, which was rung during a whole month before the forces left the city, in order that the enemy might have time to provide for his defence. So great was the virtue then existing among men, and with so much generosity of mind were they governed, that as it is now considered a brave and prudent act to assail an unprovided enemy, in those days it would have been thought disgraceful, and productive only of a fallacious advantage. This bell was also taken with the army, and served to regulate the keeping and relief of guard, and other matters necessary, in the practice of war. With these ordinations, civil and military, the Florentines established their liberty— nor is it possible to imagine the power and authority Florence in a short time acquired. She became not only the head of Tuscany, but was enumerated among the first cities of Italy, and would have attained greatness of the most exalted kind, had she not been afflicted with the continual divisions of her citizens. They remained under this government ten years, during which time they compelled the people of Pistoria, Arezzo, and Siena to enter into league with them and returning with the army from Siena they took Volterra, destroyed some castles, and led the inhabitants to Florence. All these enterprises were affected by the advice of the Guelphs, who were much more powerful than the Ghibellines, for the latter were hated by the people as well on account of their haughty bearing while in power, during the time of Frederick, as because the church party was more in favour than that of the emperor, for with the aid of the church they hoped to preserve their liberty, but with the emperor they were apprehensive of losing it. The Ghibellines, in the meantime, finding themselves divested of authority, could not rest, but watched for an occasion of repossessing the government, and they thought the favourable moment come, when they found that Manfred, son of Frederick, had made himself sovereign of Naples, and reduced the power of the church. They therefore secretly communicated with him, to resume the management of the state, but could not prevent their proceedings from coming to the knowledge of the Anziani, who immediately summoned the Uberti to appear before them, but instead of obeying they took arms and fortified themselves in their houses. The people, enraged at this, armed themselves, and with the assistance of the Guelphs compelled them to quit the city. And, 
with the whole Ghibelline party withdraw to Siena. They then asked assistance of Manfred, king of Naples, and by the able conduct of Farinata degli Uberti, the Guelphs were routed by the king's forces upon the river Arbia, with so great slaughter, that those who escaped, thinking Florence lost, did not return thither, but sought refuge at Lucca. Manfred sent the Count Giordano, a man of considerable reputation in arms, to command his forces. He, after the victory, went with the Ghibellines to Florence, and reduced the city entirely to the king's authority, annulling the magistracies and every other institution that retained any appearance of freedom. This injury, committed with little prudence, excited the ardent animosity of the people, and their enmity against the Ghibellines, whose ruin it eventually caused, was increased to the highest pitch. The necessities of the kingdom compelling the Count Giordano to return to Naples, he left at Florence as regal vicar the Count Guido Novallo, lord of Casentino, who called a council of Ghibellines at Empoli. There it was concluded, with only one dissenting voice, that in order to preserve their power in Tuscany it would be necessary to destroy Florence as the only means of compelling the Guelphs to withdraw their support from the party of the Church. To this so cruel a sentence, given against such a noble city, there was not a citizen who offered any opposition, except Farinata de Liuberti, who openly defended her, saying he had not encountered so many dangers and difficulties, but in the hope of returning to his country, that he still wished for what he had so earnestly sought, nor would he refuse the blessing which fortune now presented, even though by using it, he were to become as much an enemy of those who thought otherwise as he had been of the Guelphs, and that no one need be afraid the city would occasion the ruin of their country, for he hoped that the valour which had expelled the Guelphs would be sufficient to defend her. Farinata was a man of undaunted resolution, and excelled greatly in military affairs. Being the head of the Ghibelline party, and in high estimation with Manfred, his authority put a stop to the discussion, and induced the rest to think of some other means of preserving their power. The Lucchese being threatened with the anger of the Count, for affording refuge to the Guelphs after the Battle of Arbia, could allow them to remain no longer, so, leaving Lucca, they went to Bologna, from whence they were called by the Guelphs of Parma against the Ghibellines of that city, where, having overcome the enemy, the possessions of the latter were assigned to them, so that having increased in honours and riches, and learning that Pope Clement had invited Charles of Anjou to take the kingdom from Manfred, they sent ambassadors to the Pope to offer him their services. His Holiness not only received them as friends, but gave them a standard upon which his insignia were wrought. It was ever after borne by the Guelphs in battle, and is still used at Florence. Charles, having taken the kingdom from Manfred and slain him, to which success the Guelphs of Florence had contributed, their party became more powerful, and that of the Ghibellines proportionately weaker. In consequence of this, those who with Count Novello governed the city, thought it would be advisable to attach to themselves, with some concession, the people whom they had previously aggravated with every species of injury. But these remedies which, if applied before the necessity came, would have been beneficial, being offered when they were no longer considered favours, not only failed of producing any beneficial results to the donors, but hastened their ruin. Thinking, however, to win them to their interests, they restored some of the honours of which they had deprived them. They elected thirty-six citizens from the higher rank of the people, to whom, with two cavaliers, knights or gentlemen, brought from Bologna, the reformation of the government of the city was confided. As soon as they met, they classed the whole of the people according to their arts or trades, and over each art appointed a magistrate, whose duty was to distribute justice to those placed under him. They gave to each company or trade a banner, under which every man was expected to appear armed whenever the city required it. These arts were at first twelve, seven major and five minor. The minor arts were afterward increased to fourteen, so that the whole made as at present, twenty-one. The thirty-six reformers also effected other changes for the common good. Count Guido proposed to lay a tax upon the citizens for the support of the soldiery, 
but during the discussion found so much difficulty that he did not dare to use force to obtain it, and thinking he had now lost the government, called together the leaders of the Ghibellines, and they determined to wrest from the people those powers which they had with so little prudence conceded. When they thought they had sufficient force, the thirty-six being assembled, they caused a tumult to be raised, which so alarmed them that they retired to their houses, when suddenly the banners of the arts were unfurled, and many armed men drawn to them. These, learning that Count Guido and his followers were at St. John's, moved toward the Holy Trinity, and chose Giovanni Soldanieri for their leader. The Count, on the other hand, being informed where the people were assembled, proceeded in that direction, nor did the people shun the fight, for, meeting their enemies where now stands the residence of the Torna Quincy, they put the Count to flight, with the loss of many of his followers. Terrified with this result, he was afraid his enemies would attack him in the night, and that his own party, finding themselves beaten, would murder him. This impression took such hold of his mind that, without attempting any other remedy, he sought his safety rather in flight than in combat, and, contrary to the advice of the rectors, went with all his people to Prato. But on finding himself in a place of safety his fears fled. Perceiving his error, he wished to correct it, and on the following day, as soon as light appeared, he returned with his people to Florence, to enter the city by force, which he had abandoned in cowardice. But his design did not succeed, for the people, who had had difficulty in expelling him, kept him out with facility, so that with grief and shame he went to the Casentino, and the Ghibellines withdrew to their villas. The people being victorious, by the advice of those who loved the good of the Republic, determined to reunite the city, and recall all the citizens, as well Guelph as Ghibelline, who yet remained without. The Guelphs returned, after having been expelled six years. The recent offences of the Ghibellines were forgiven, and themselves restored to their country. They were, however, most cordially hated, both by the people and the Guelphs, for the latter could not forget their exile, and the former but too well remembered their tyranny when they were in power. The result was that the minds of neither party became settled. While affairs were in this state at Florence, a report prevailed that Corradino, nephew of Manfred, was coming with a force from Germany, for the conquest of Naples. This gave the Ghibellines hope of recovering power, and the Guelphs, considering how they should provide for their security, requested assistance from Charles for their defence, in case of the passage of Corradino. The coming of the forces of Charles rendered the Guelphs insolent, and so alarmed the Ghibellines that they fled the city, without being driven out, two days before the arrival of the troops. The Ghibellines having departed, the Florentines reorganized the government of the city, and elected twelve men who, as the supreme power, were to hold their magistracy two months, and were not called Anziani, or ancients, but Buono Uomini, or good men. They also formed a council of eighty citizens, which they called the Credenza. Besides these, from each sixth, Thirty citizens were chosen, who, with the credenza and the twelve buono uomini, were called the general council. They also appointed another council of one hundred and twenty citizens, elected from the people and the nobility, to which all those things were finally referred that had undergone the consideration of the other councils, and which distributed the offices of the republic. Having formed this government, they strengthened the Guelphic party by appointing its friends to the principal offices of state, and a variety of other measures, that they might be enabled to defend themselves against the Ghibellines, whose property they divided into three parts, one of which was applied to the public use, another to the Capitani, and the third was assigned to the Guelphs, in satisfaction of the injuries they had received. The Pope, too, in order to keep Tuscany in the Guelphic interest, made Charles imperial vicar over the province. While the Florentines, by virtue of the new government, preserved their influence at home by laws, and abroad with arms, the Pope died, and after a dispute which continued two years, Gregory the Tenth was elected, being then in Syria, where he had long lived. 
but not having witnessed the working of parties, he did not estimate them in the manner his predecessors had done, and passing through Florence on his way to France, he thought it would be the office of a good pastor to unite the city, and so far succeeded that the Florentines consented to receive the syndics of the Ghibellines in Florence to consider the terms of their recall. They effected an agreement, but the Ghibellines without were so terrified that they did not venture to return. The Pope laid the whole blame upon the city, and being enraged, excommunicated her, in which state of contumacy she remained as long as the pontiff lived, but was re-blessed by his successor, Innocent V. The pontificate was afterward occupied by Nicholas III of the Orsini family. It has to be remarked that it was invariably the custom of the popes to be jealous of those whose power in Italy had become great, even when its growth had been occasioned by the favours of the church. And, as they always endeavoured to destroy it, frequent troubles and changes were the result. Their fear of a powerful person caused them to increase the influence of one previously weak. His becoming great caused him also to be feared, and his being feared made them seek the means of destroying him. This mode of thinking and operation occasioned the kingdom of Naples to be taken from Manfred and given to Charles, but as soon as the latter became powerful his ruin was resolved upon. Actuated by these motives, Nicholas III contrived that, with the influence of the emperor, the government of Tuscany should be taken from Charles, and Latino, his legate, was therefore sent into the province in the name of the empire. End of Book Two, Chapter Two. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on August 1, 2008, in San Diego, California. Book Two, Chapter Three of A History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book Two, Chapter Three, Changes in Florence, The Ghibellinis Recalled, New Form of Government in Florence, The Signatory Created, Victory over the Aretines, The Gonfalonier of Justice Created, Ubaldo Ruffoli, the First Gonfalonier, Giano della Bella. New reform by his advice. Giano della Bella becomes a voluntary exile. Dissensions between the people and the nobility. The tumults composed. Reform of government. Public buildings. The prosperous state of the city. Florence was at this time in a very unhappy condition, for the great Guelphic families had become insolent, and set aside the authority of the magistrates, so that murders and other atrocities were daily committed, and the perpetrators escaped unpunished, under the protection of one or another of the nobility. The leaders of the people, in order to restrain this insolence, determined to recall those who had been expelled, and thus gave the legate an opportunity of uniting the city. The Ghibellinis returned, and instead of twelve governors, fourteen were appointed, seven for each party, who held their office one year, and were to be chosen by the Pope. The Florentines lived under this government two years, till the pontificate of Martin, who restored to Charles all the authority which had been taken from him by Nicholas, so that parties were again active in Tuscany, for the Florentines took arms against the emperor's governor, and to deprive the Ghibellinis of power, and restrain the nobility, established a new form of government. This was in the year 1282, and the companies of the arts, since magistrates had been appointed and colors given to them, had acquired so great influence, that of their own authority they ordered that, instead of fourteen citizens, three should be appointed and called priors, to hold the government of the Republic two months, and chosen from either the people or the nobility. After the expiration of the first magistracy they were augmented to six, that one might be chosen from each sixth of the city, and this number was preserved till the year 1342, when the city was divided into quarters, and the priors became eight, although upon some occasions during the interim they were twelve. This government, as will be seen hereafter, occasioned the ruin of the nobility, for the people by various causes excluded them from all participation in it, and then trampled upon them without respect. 
The nobles, at first, owing to their divisions among themselves, made no opposition, and each being anxious to rob the other of influence in the state, they lost it altogether. To this government a palace was given, in which they were to reside constantly, and all requisite officers were appointed, it having been previously the custom of councils and magistrates to assemble in churches. At first they were only called priors, but to increase their distinction the word signori, or lords, was soon afterward adopted. The Florentines remained for some time in domestic quiet, during which they made war with the Aretines for having expelled the Guelphs, and obtained a complete victory over them at Campaldino. The city being increased in riches and population, it was found expedient to extend the walls, the circle of which was enlarged to the extent it at present remains, although its diameter was previously only the space between the old bridge and the church of St. Lorenzo. Wars abroad and peace within the city had caused the Guelph and Ghibelline factions to become almost extinct, and the only party feeling which seemed occasionally to glow was that which naturally exists in all cities between the higher classes and the people, for the latter, wishing to live in conformity with the laws, and the former to be themselves the rulers of the people, it was not possible for them to abide in perfect amity together. This ungenial disposition, while their fear of the Ghibellines kept them in order, did not discover itself. But no sooner were they subdued than it broke forth, and not a day passed without some of the populace being injured, while the laws were insufficient to procure redress, for every noble, with his relations and friends, defended himself against the forces of the priors and the capitano. To remedy this evil, the leaders of the arts companies ordered that every signori, at the time of entering upon the duties of office, should appoint a gonfalonier of justice, chosen from the people, and place a thousand men at his disposal divided into twenty companies of fifty men each, and that he, with his gonfalon, or banner, and his forces, should be ready to enforce the execution of the laws whenever called upon, either by the signors themselves or the capitano. The first elected to this high office was Ubaldo Rofoli. This man unfurled his gonfalon, and destroyed the houses of Galetti, on account of a member of that family having slain one of the Florentine people in France. The violent animosities among the nobility enabled the companies of the arts to establish this law with facility, and the former no sooner saw the provision which had been made against them, than they felt the acrimonious spirit with which it was enforced. At first it impressed them with greater terror, but they soon after returned to their accustomed insolence, for one or more of their body always making part of the seigneury, gave them opportunities of impeding the gonfalonier, so that he could not perform the duties of his office. Besides this, the accuser always required a witness of the injury he had received, and no one dared to give evidence against the nobility. Thus, in a short time, Florence again fell into the same disorders as before, and the tyranny exercised against the people was as great as ever, for the decisions of justice were either prevented or delayed, and sentences were not carried into execution. In this unhappy state, the people not knowing what to do, Giano della Bella, of a very noble family, and a lover of liberty, encouraged the heads of the arts to reform the constitution of the city, and by his advice it was ordered that the gonfalonier should reside with the priors, and have four thousand men at his command. They deprived the nobility of the right to sit in the seigneury. They condemned the associates of a criminal to the same penalty as himself, and ordered that public report should be taken as evidence. By these laws, which were called the ordinations of justice, the people acquired great influence, and Giano della Bella not a small sphere of trouble, for he was thoroughly hated by the great, as the destroyer of their power, while the opulent among the people envied him, for they thought he possessed too great authority this became evident upon the very first occasion that presented itself. It happened that a man from the class of the people was killed in a riot, in which several of the nobility had taken a part, and among the rest Corso Donati, to whom, as the most forward of the party, the death was attributed. He was, therefore, taken by the captain of the people, and whether he was really innocent of the crime, or the capitano was afraid of condemning him, he was acquitted. This acquittal displeased the people so much, that seizing their arms, they ran to the house of Giano della Bella, to beg that he would compel the execution of those laws which he had himself made. Giano, who wished Corso to be punished, did not insist upon their laying down their arms, 
as many were of opinion he ought to have done, but advised them to go to the seigneury, complain of the fact, and beg that they would take it into consideration. The people, full of wrath, thinking themselves insulted by the Capitano and abandoned by Giano della Bella, instead of going to the seigneury, went to the palace of the Capitano, of which they made themselves masters, and plundered it. This outrage displeased the whole city, and those who wished the ruin of Giano laid the entire blame upon him, and as in the succeeding seigneury there was an enemy of his, he was accused to the Capitano as the originator of the riot. While the case was being tried, the people took arms, and proceeding to his house, offered to defend him against the seigneury and his enemies. Giano, however, did not wish to put this burst of popular favour to the proof, or trust his life to the magistrates, for he feared the malignity of the latter and the instability of the former. So in order to remove an occasion for his enemies to injure him, or his friends to offend the laws, he determined to withdraw, deliver his countrymen from the fear they had of him, and leaving the city which, at his own charge and peril, he had delivered from the servitude of the great, became a voluntary exile. After the departure of Giano della Bella, the nobility began to entertain hopes of recovering their authority, and judging their misfortune to have arisen from their divisions, they sent two of their body to the seigneury, which they thought was favourable to them, to beg they would be pleased to moderate the severity of the laws made against them. As soon as their demand became known, the minds of the people were much excited, for they were afraid the seigneurs would submit to them, and so, between the desire of the nobility and the jealousy of the people, arms were resorted to. The nobility were drawn together in three places, near the church of St. John, in the New Market, and in the piazza of the Mozzi, under three leaders, Borese Adamari, Vanni de Mozzi, and Jerry Spini. The people assembled in immense numbers, under their ensigns, before the palace of the seigneury, which at that time was situated near St. Procolo, and as they suspected the integrity of the seigneury, they added six citizens to their number to take part in the management of affairs. While both parties were preparing for the fight, some individuals, as well of the people as of the nobility, accompanied by a few priests of respectable character, mingled among them for the purpose of effecting a pacification, reminding the nobility that their loss of power, and the laws which were made against them, had been occasioned by their haughty conduct, and the mischievous tendency of their proceedings, that resorting to arms to recover by force what they had lost by illiberal measures and disunion, would tend to the destruction of their country and increase the difficulties of their own position, that they should bear in mind that the people, both in riches, numbers, and hatred, were far stronger than they, and that their nobility, on account of which they assumed to be above others, did not contribute to win battles, and would be found, when they came to arms, to be but an empty name, and insufficient to defend them against so many. On the other hand, they reminded the people that it is not prudent to wish always to have the last blow, that it is an injudicious step to drive men to desperation, for he who is without hope is also without fear, that they ought not to forget that in the wars the nobility had always done honour to the country, and therefore it was neither wise nor just to pursue them with so much bitterness, and that although the nobility could bear with patience the loss of the supreme magistracy, they could not endure that by the existing laws it should be in the power of every one to drive them from their country, and therefore it would be well to qualify these laws, and, in furtherance of so good a result, be better to lay down their arms, than, trusting to numbers, try the fortune of a battle. For it is often seen that the many are overcome by the few. Variety of opinion was found among the people. Many wished to decide the question by arms at once, for they were assured it would have to be done some time, and that it would be better to do so then, than delay till the enemy had acquired greater strength, and that if they thought a mitigation of the laws would satisfy them, that then they would be glad to comply but that the pride of the nobility was so great that they would not submit unless they were compelled. To many others, who were more peaceable and better disposed, it appeared a less evil to qualify the laws a little than to come to battle, and their opinion prevailing, it was provided that no accusation against the nobility could be received unless supported with sufficient testimony. Although arms were laid aside, both parties remained full of suspicion, and each fortified itself with men in places of strength. The people reorganized the government, and lessened the number of its officers, to which measure they were induced by finding that the seigneurs appointed from the families, of which the following were the heads, had been favorable to the nobility, viz., 
the Mancini, Magalotti, Altoviti, Peruzzi, and Ceritani. Having settled the government, for the greater magnificence and security of the signory, they laid the foundation of their palace, and to make space for the piazza, removed the houses that had belonged to the Uberti. They also, at the same period, commenced the public prisons. These buildings were completed in a few years, nor did our city ever enjoy a greater state of prosperity than in those times, filled with men of great wealth and reputation, possessing within her walls thirty thousand men capable of bearing arms, and in the country seventy thousand, while the whole of Tuscany, either as subjects or friends, owed obedience to Florence. And although there might be some indignation and jealousy between the nobility and the people, they did not produce any evil effect, but all lived together in unity and peace. And if this peace had not been disturbed by internal enmities, there would have been no cause of apprehension whatever, for the city had nothing to fear, either from the empire or from those citizens whom political reasons kept from their homes, and was in condition to meet all the states of Italy with her own forces. The evil, however, which external powers could not effect, was brought about by those within. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of A History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Book Two, Chapter Four The Cerchi and the Donati. Origin of the Bianca and Nera factions in Pistoia they come to Florence. Open enmity of the Donati and the Cerchi. Their first conflict. The Cerchi head the Bianchi faction. The Donati take part with the Nera. The Pope's legate at Florence increases the confusion with an interdict. New affray between the Cerchi and the Donati. The Donati and others of the Nera faction banished by the advice of Dante Alighieri. Charles of Valois sent by the Pope to Florence. The Florentines suspect him. Corso Donati and the rest of the Neri party return to Florence. Very Cerchi flies. The Pope's legate again comes in Florence. The city again interdicted. New disturbances. The Bianchi banished. Dante banished. Corso Donati excites fresh troubles. The Pope's legate endeavors to restore the emigrants, but does not succeed. Great fire in Florence. The Cerchi and the Donati were, for riches, nobility, and the number and influence of their followers, perhaps the two most distinguished families in Florence. Being neighbors, both in the city and the country, there had arisen between them some slight displeasure, which, however, had not occasioned an open quarrel, and perhaps never would have produced any serious effect, if the malignant humours had not been increased by new causes. Among the first families of Pistoia was the Cancellieri. It happened that Lore, son of Guillermo, and Jerry, son of Bartaca, both of this family, playing together and coming to words, Jerry was slightly wounded by Lore. Thus displeased Guillermo, and, by designing a suitable apology to remove all cause of further animosity, he ordered his son to go to the house of the father of the youth whom he had wounded and ask pardon. Lore obeyed his father, but this act of virtue failed to soften the cruel mind of Bartaca, and having caused Lore to be seized, in order to add the greatest indignity to his brutal act, he ordered his servants to chop off the youth's hand upon a block used for cutting meat upon, and then said to him, Go to thy father and tell him that sword wounds are cured with iron and not with words. The unfeeling barbarity of this act so greatly exasperated Guglielmo that he ordered his people to take arms for his revenge. Bertaca prepared for his defence, and not only that family, but the whole city of Pistoia, became divided. And as the Cancellieri were descended from a Cancellier who had two wives, of whom one was called Bianca, white, one party was named by those who were descended from her Bianca, and the other, by way of a greater distinction, was called Nera, black. Much and long-continued strife took place between the two, attended with the death of many men and the destruction of much property, and not being able to effect a union among themselves, but weary of the evil, and anxious either to bring it to an end, or by engaging others in their quarrel, increase it, they came to Florence, 
where the Neri, on account of their familiarity with the Donati, were favoured by Corso, the head of that family, and on this account the Bianchi, that they might have a powerful head to defend them against the Donati, had recourse to Veri de Cerci, a man in no respect inferior to Corso. This quarrel, and the parties in it, brought from Pistoia, increased the old animosity between the Cerci and the Donati, and it was already so manifest, that the priors and all well-dispersed men were hourly in apprehension of its breaking out, causing a division of the whole city. They therefore applied to the pontiff, praying that he would interpose his authority between these turbulent parties, and provide the remedy which they found themselves unable to furnish. The Pope sent for Veri, and charged him to make peace with the Donati, at which Veri exhibited great astonishment, saying that he had no enmity against them, and that as pacification presupposes war, he did not know, there being no war between them, how peacemaking could be necessary. Veri, having returned from Rome without anything being effected, the rage of the parties increased to such a degree, that any trivial accident seemed sufficient to make it burst forth, as indeed presently happened. It was in the month of May, during which, and upon holidays, it is the custom of Florence to hold festivals and public rejoicings throughout the city. Some youths of the Donati family, with their friends, upon horseback, were standing near the church of the Holy Trinity to look at a party of ladies who were dancing. Thither also came some of the churchy, like the Donati, accompanied with many of the nobility, and not knowing that the Donati were before them, pushed their horses and jostled them. Thereupon the Donati, thinking themselves insulted, drew their swords. Nor were the churchy at all backwards to do the same, and not till after the interchange of many wounds they separated. This disturbance was the beginning of great evils, for the whole city became divided, the people as well as the nobility, and the parties took the names of the Bianchi and the Neri. The churchy were at the head of the Bianchi faction, to which adhered the Adamari, the Abati, a part of the Tosingi, of the Bardi, of the Rossi, of the Frescobaldi, of the Nerli, and of the Manelli, and all the Mozzi, the Scali, Gherardini, Cavalcanti, Malaspini, Bostichi, Giandonati, Vecchietti, and Aragucci. To these were joined many families of the people, and all the Ghibellinis then in Florence, so that their numbers gave them almost the entire government of the city. The Donati, at the head of whom was Corso, joined the Neri party, to which also adhered those members of the above-named families who did not take part with the Bianchi, and besides these, the whole of the Pazzi, the Bistomini, Manieri, Bagnesi, Tornaquinci, Spini, Buondelmonti, Gian Figliazzi, and the Brunellici. Nor did the evil confine itself to the city alone, for the whole country was divided upon it, so that the captains of the six parts, and whoever were attached to the Guelphic party or the well-being of the Republic, were very much afraid that this new division would occasion the destruction of the city, and give new life to the Ghibelline faction. They therefore sent again to Pope Boniface, desiring that, unless he wished that city which had always been the shield of the Church, should either be ruined or become Ghibelline, he would consider some means for her relief. Cardinal Matteo da Quasparta, a Portuguese, who, finding the Bianchi as the most powerful, the least in fear, not quite submissive to him, he interdicted the city and left it in anger, so that greater confusion now prevailed than had done previously to his coming. The minds of men being in great excitement, it happened that at a funeral which many of the Donati and the Churchy attended, they first came to words and then to arms, from which, however, nothing but merely tumult resulted at the moment. However, having each retired to their houses, the Churchy determined to attack the Donati, but by the valour of Corso they were repulsed, and great numbers of them wounded. The city was in arms. The laws and the seigneury were set at naught by the rage of the nobility, and the best and wisest citizens were full of apprehension. The Donati and their followers, being the least powerful, were in the greatest fear, and to provide for their safety they called together Corso, the captains of the parts, and the other leaders of the Neri, and resolved to apply to the Pope to appoint some personage of royal blood, that he might reform Florence, thinking by this means to overcome the Bianchi. Their meeting and determination became known to the priors, and the adverse party represented it as a conspiracy against the liberties of the Republic. Both parties being in arms, the Signory, one of whom at that time was the poet Dante, took courage, 
and from his advice and prudence, caused the people to rise for the preservation of order, and being joined by many from the country, they compelled the leaders of both parties to lay aside their arms, and banished Corso with many of the Neri. And as an evidence of the impartiality of their motives, they also banished many of the Bianchi, who, however, soon afterward, under pretense of some justifiable cause, returned. Corso and his friends, thinking the Pope favourable to their party, went to Rome and laid their grievances before him, having previously forwarded a statement of them in writing. Charles of Valois, brother of the King of France, was then at the papal court, having been called into Italy by the King of Naples to go over into Sicily. The Pope, therefore, at the earnest prayers of the banished Florentines, consented to send Charles to Florence, till the season suitable for his going to Sicily should arrive. He therefore came, and although the Bianchi, who then governed, were very apprehensive, still, as the head of the Guelphs, and appointed by the Pope, they did not dare to oppose him, and in order to secure his friendship they gave him authority to dispose of the city as he thought proper. Thus authorized, Charles armed all his friends and followers, which step gave the people so strong a suspicion that he designed to rob them of their liberty, that each took arms, and kept at his own house, in order to be ready, if Charles should make any such attempt. The Cherchi and the leaders of the Bianchi faction had acquired universal hatred by having, while at the head of the Republic, conducted themselves with unbecoming pride, and this induced Corso and the banished of the Neri party to return to Florence, knowing well that Charles and the captains of the parts were favourable to them. And while the city, for fear of Charles, kept themselves in arms, Corso, with all the banished, and followed by many others, entered Florence without the least impediment. And although Veri di Cerci was advised to oppose him, he refused to do so, saying that he wished the people of Florence, against whom he came, should punish him. However, the contrary happened, for he was welcomed, and not punished by them, and it behooved Veri to save himself by flight. Corso, having forced the Pinti Gate, assembled his party at San Pietro Maggiore, near his own house, where, having drawn together a great number of friends and people desirous of change, he set at liberty all who had been imprisoned for offences, whether against the state or against individuals. He compelled the existing seniory to withdraw privately to their own houses, elected a new one from the people of the Neri party, and for five days plundered the leaders of the Bianchi. The Cerchi, and the other heads of their faction, finding Charles opposed to them, withdrew from the city, and retired to their strongholds. And although at first they would not listen to the advice of the Pope, they were now compelled to turn to him for assistance, declaring that, instead of uniting the city, Charles had caused greater disunion than before. The Pope again sent Matteo da Quasparta, his legate, who made peace between the Cerchi and the Donati, and strengthened it with marriages and new betrothals. But wishing that the Bianchi should participate in the employments of the government, to which the Neri, who were then at the head of it, would not consent, he withdrew, with no more satisfaction, nor less enraged, than on the former occasion, and left the city interdicted for disobedience. Both parties remained in Florence, and equally discontented, the Neri from seeing their enemies at hand, and apprehending the loss of their power, and the Bianchi from finding themselves without either honour or authority, and to these natural causes of animosity new injuries were added. Niccolo de Cerchi, with many of his friends, went to his estates, and being arrived at the bridge of Africo, was attacked by Simon, son of Corso Donati. The contest was obstinate, and on each side had a sorrowful conclusion, for Niccolo was slain, and Simon was so severely wounded that he died on the following night. This event again disturbed the entire city, and although the Neri were the most to blame, they were defended by those who were at the head of affairs, and before sentence was delivered, a conspiracy of the Bianchi with Piero Ferrante, one of the barons who had accompanied Charles, was discovered, by whose assistance they sought to be replaced in the government. The matter became known from letters addressed to him by the Cerchi, although some were of opinion that they were not genuine, but written and pretended to be found, by the Donati, to abate the infamy which their party had acquired by the death of Niccolo. The whole of the Cerchi were, however, banished, with their followers of the Bianchi party, of whom was Dante the poet, their property confiscated, and their houses pulled down. They sought refuge, with a great number of Ghibellines who had joined them, in many places, seeking fresh fortunes and new undertakings. 
Charles, having effected the purpose of his coming, left the city, and returned to the Pope to pursue his enterprise against Sicily, in which he was neither wiser nor more fortunate than he had been at Florence, so that with disgrace and the loss of many of his followers he withdrew to France. After the departure of Charles, Florence remained quiet. Corso alone was restless, thinking that he did not possess that sort of authority in the city which was due to his rank, for the government, being in the hands of the people, he saw the offices of the Republic administered by many inferior to himself. Moved by passions of this kind, he endeavoured, under the pretense of an honourable design, to justify his own dishonourable purposes, and accused many citizens, who had the management of the public money, of applying it to their private uses, and recommended that they should be brought to justice and punished. This opinion was adopted by many who had the same views as himself, and many in ignorance joined them, thinking Corso actuated only by pure patriotism. On the other hand, the accused citizens, enjoying the popular favour, defended themselves, and this difference arose to such a height, that after civil means they had recourse to arms. Of the one party were Corso and Lottieri, Bishop of Florence, with many of the nobility and some of the people. On the other side were the seniory, with the greater part of the people, so that skirmishes took place in many parts of the city. The seniory, seeing their danger great, sent for aid to Lucchese, and presently all the people of Lucca were in Florence. With their assistance the disturbances were settled for the moment, and the people retained the government and their liberty, without attempting by any other means to punish the movers of the disorder. The Pope had heard of the tumults at Florence, and sent his legate, Niccolò de Prata, to settle them, who, being in high reputation both for his quality, learning, and mode of life, presently acquired so much of the people's confidence, that authority was given him to establish such a government as he should think proper. As he was of Ghibelline origin, he determined to recall the banished, but designing first to gain the affections of the lower orders, he retained the ancient companies of the people, which increased the popular power and reduced that of the nobility. The legate, thinking the multitude on his side, now endeavoured to recall the banished, and after attempting in many ways, none of which succeeded, he fell so completely under the suspicion of the government that he was compelled to quit the city, and return to the Pope in great wrath leaving Florence full of confusion and suffering under an interdict. Neither was the city disturbed by one division alone, but by many, first the enmity between the people and the nobility, then that of the Ghibellines and the Guelphs, and lastly of the Bianchi and the Neri. All the citizens were, therefore, in arms, for many were dissatisfied with the departure of the legate, and wished for the return of the banished. The first who set this disturbance on foot were the Medici and the Guinigi, who with the legate had discovered themselves in favour of the rebels, and thus skirmishes took place in many parts of the city. In addition to these evils a fire occurred, which first broke out at the garden of St. Michael, in the houses of the Abati. It thence extended to those of the Capuansaki, and consumed them, with those of the Machi, Ameri, Tashi, Cipriani, Lamberti, Cavalcanti, and the whole of the New Market. From thence it spread to the gate of St. Maria, and burned it to the ground. Turning from the old bridge, it destroyed the houses of the Garadini, Pulci, Amade, and Lucardesi, and with these so many others that the number amounted to seventeen hundred. It was the opinion of many that this fire occurred by accident during the heat of the disturbances. Others affirm that it was begun willfully by Neri Abati, prior of St. Pietro Scaraggio, a dissolute character, fond of mischief who, seeing the people occupied with the combat, took the opportunity of committing a wicked act, for which the citizens, being thus employed, could offer no remedy. And to inure his success, he set fire to the house of his own brotherhood, where he had the best opportunity of doing it. This was in the year 1304. Florence being afflicted both with fire and the sword, Corso Donati alone remained unarmed in so many tumults, for he thought he would more easily become the arbitrator between the contending parties when, weary of strife, they should be inclined to accommodation. They laid down their arms, however, rather from satiety of evil than from any desire of union, and the only consequence was that the banished were not recalled, and the party which favoured them remained inferior. End of Book Two, Chapter Four Book Two, Chapter Five of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolò Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Book 2, Chapter 5. The immigrants attempt to re-enter Florence, but are not allowed to do so. The companies of the people restored. Restless conduct of Corso Donati. The ruin of Corso Donati. Corso Donati accused and condemned. Riot at the house of Corso. Death of Corso. His character. Fruitless attempt of the Emperor Henry against the Florentines. The emigrants are restored to the city. The citizens place themselves under the King of Naples for five years. War with Uguccione della Fagiola. The Florentines routed. Florence withdraws herself from the subjection to King Robert, and expels the Count Novolo. Lando da Gobbio. His tyranny. His departure. The legate, being returned to Rome, and hearing of the new disturbance which had occurred, persuaded the Pope that if he wished to unite the Florentines, it would be necessary to have twelve of the first citizens appear before him, and having thus removed the principal causes of disunion, he might easily put a stop to it. The pontiff took this advice, and the citizens, among whom was Corso Donati, obeyed the summons. These having left the city, the legate told the exiles that now, when the city was deprived of her leaders, was the time for them to return. They therefore, having assembled, came to Florence, and entering by a part of the wall not yet completed, proceeded to the piazza of St. Giovanni. It is worthy of remark that those who, a short time previously, when they came unarmed, and begged to be restored to their country, had fought for their return, now, when they saw them in arms and resolved to enter by force, took arms to oppose them, so much more was the common good esteemed than private friendship, and being joined by the rest of the citizens, compelled them to return to the places whence they had come. They failed in their undertaking by having left a part of their force at Lastra, and by not having waited the arrival of Tolesi Uberti, who had to come from Pistoia with three hundred horse, for they thought celerity rather than numbers would give them the victory, and it often happens in similar enterprises that delay robs us of the occasion, and too great anxiety to be forward prevents us of the power, or makes us act before we are properly prepared. The banished having retired, Florence again returned to her old divisions, and in order to deprive the Cavalcanti of their authority, the people took from them the Stinci, a castle situated in the Val de Greve, and anciently belonging to the family. And as those who were taken in it were the first who were put into the new prisons, the latter were, and still continue, named after it, the Stinci. The leaders of the Republic also re-established the companies of the people, and gave them the ensigns that were first used by the companies of the arts, the heads of which were called gonfaloniers of the companies, and colleagues of the seigneury, and ordered that when any disturbance arose they should assist the seigneury with arms, and in peace with counsel. To the ancient rectors they added an executor, or sheriff, who with the gonfaloniers was to aid in repressing the insolence of the nobility. In the meantime the Pope died. Corso, with the other citizens, returned from Rome, and all would have been well if his restless mind had not occasioned new troubles. It was his common practice to be of a contrary opinion to the most powerful men in the city, and whatever he saw the people inclined to do, he exercised his utmost influence to effect, in order to attach them to himself, so that he was a leader in all differences, at the head of every new scheme, and whoever wished to obtain anything extraordinary had recourse to him. This conduct caused him to be hated by many of the highest distinction, and their hatred increased to such a degree, that the nary faction to which he belonged became completely divided, for Corso, to attain his ends, had availed himself of private force and authority, and of the enemies of the state. But so great was the influence attached to his person, that every one feared him. Nevertheless, in order to strip him of the popular favour, which by this means may be easily done, a report was set on foot that he intended to make himself prince of the city, and to the design his conduct gave great appearance of probability, for his way of living quite exceeded all civil bounds, and the opinion gained further strength upon his taking to wife a daughter of Uguccione della Faguola, the head of the Ghibelline and Bianchi faction, and one of the most powerful men in Tuscany. When this marriage became known it gave courage to his adversaries, and they took arms against him, for the same reason the people ceased to defend him, and the greater part of them joined the ranks of his enemies, 
the leaders of whom were Rosso della Tosi, Pazzino de Paesi, Geri Spini, and Berto Brunelleschi. These, with their followers, and the greater part of the people, assembled before the palace of the Signory, by whose command a charge was made before Piero Branca, captain of the people, against Corso, of intending, with the aid of Uguccione, to usurp the government. He was then summoned, and for disobedience declared a rebel, nor did two hours pass over between the accusation and the sentence. The judgment being given, the seigneury, with the companies of the people under their ensigns, went in search of him, who, although seeing himself abandoned by many of his followers, aware of the sentence against him, the power of the seigneury, and the multitude of his enemies, remained undaunted, and fortified his houses, in the hope of defending them till Uguccione, for whom he had sent, should come to his relief. His residences and the streets approaching them were barricaded and taken possession of by his partisans, who defended them so bravely that the enemy, although in great numbers, could not force them, and the battle became one of the hottest, with wounds and death on all sides. But the people, finding they could not drive them from their ground, took possession of the adjoining houses, and by unobserved passages obtained entry. Corso, thus finding himself surrounded by his foes, no longer retaining any hope of assistance from Uguccione, and without a chance of victory, thought only of effecting his personal safety, and with Gerardo Bordoni, and some of his bravest and most trusted friends, fought a passage through the thickest of their enemies, and effected their escape from the city by the gate of the cross. They were, however, pursued by vast numbers, and Gerardo was slain upon the bridge of Africo by Boccaccio Caviculi. Corso was overtaken and made prisoner by a party of Catalan horse, in the service of the seigneury, at Rovazzano. But when approaching Florence, that he might avoid being seen and torn to pieces by his victorious enemies, he allowed himself to fall from horseback, and being down, one of those who conducted him cut his throat. The body was found by the monks of San Salvi, and buried without any ceremony due his rank. Such was the end of Corso, to whom his country and the Neri faction were indebted, for much both of good and evil, and if he had possessed a cooler spirit he would have left behind him a more happy memory. Nevertheless, he deserves to be enumerated among the most distinguished men our city has produced. True it is that his restless conduct made both his country and his party forgetful of their obligation to him. The same cause also produced his miserable end, and brought many troubles upon both his friends and his country. Uguccione, coming to the assistance of his relative, learned at Romoli that Corso had been overcome by the people, and finding that he could not render him any assistance, in order to avoid bringing evil upon himself without occasion, he returned home. After the death of Corso, which occurred in the year 1308, the disturbances were appeased, and the people lived quietly till it was reported that the Emperor Henry was coming into Italy, and with him all the Florentine emigrants, to whom he had promised restoration to their country. The leaders of the government thought, that in order to lessen the number of their enemies, it would be well to recall, of their own will, all who had been expelled, excepting such as the law had expressly forbidden to return. Of the number not admitted were the greater part of the Ghibellines, and some of those of the Bianchi faction, among whom were Dante Alighieri, the sons of Veri de Cerci, and of Giano della Bella. Besides this they sent for aid to Robert, king of Naples, and not being able to obtain it of him as friends, they gave their city to him for five years, that he might defend them as his own people. The emperor entered Italy by the way of Pisa, and proceeded by the marshes to Rome, where he was crowned in the year 1312. Then, having determined to subdue the Florentines, he approached their city by way of Perugia and Arezzo, and halted with his army at the monastery of San Salvi, about a mile from Florence, where he remained fifty days without effecting anything. Despairing of success against Florence, he returned to Pisa, where he entered into an agreement with Frederick, king of Sicily, to undertake the conquest of Naples, and proceeded with his people accordingly, but while filled with the hope of victory, and carrying dismay into the heart of King Robert, having reached Buon Convento, he died. Shortly after this, Uguccione della Fagiola, having by means of the Ghibelline party become lord of Pisa and of Lucca, caused, with the assistance of these cities, very serious annoyance to the neighbouring places. In order to effect their relief, the Florentines requested King Robert would allow his brother Piero to take command of their armies. On the other hand, Uguccione continued to increase his power, and either by force or fraud obtained possession of many castles in the Val d'Arno and the Val di Nievoli, 
and having besieged Monte Catani, the Florentines found it would be necessary to send to its relief, that they might not see him burn and destroy their whole territory. Having drawn together a large army, they entered Val di Nievoli, where they came up with Uguccione, and were routed after a severe battle, in which Piero, the king's brother, and two thousand men were slain. But the body of the prince was never found. Neither was the victory a joyful one to Uguccione, for one of his sons, and many of the leaders of his army, fell in the strife. The Florentines, after this defeat, fortified their territory, and King Robert sent them, for commander of their forces, the Count d'Andria, usually called Count Novello, by whose deportment, or because it is natural to the Florentines to find every state tedious, the city, notwithstanding the war with Uguccione, became divided into friends and enemies of the king. Simon della Tosa, the Magalati, and certain others of the people who had attained greater influence in the government than the rest, were leaders of the party against the king. By these means messengers were sent to France, and afterward into Germany, to solicit leaders and forces that they might drive out the count, whom the king had appointed governor, but they failed of obtaining any. Nevertheless they did not abandon their undertaking, but, still desirous of one whom they might worship, after an unavailing search in France and Germany, they discovered him at Abagio, and having expelled the Count Novello, caused Lando da Baggio to be brought into the city as Bargello, sheriff, and gave him the most unlimited power of the citizens. This man was cruel and rapacious, and going through the company accompanied with an armed force, he put many to death at the mere instigation of those who had endowed him with authority. His insolence rose to such a height that he stamped base metal with the impression used upon the money of the state, and no one had sufficient courage to oppose him, so powerful had he come by the discords of Florence. Great, certainly, but unhappy city, which neither the memory of past divisions, the fear of her enemies, nor a king's authority, could unite for her own advantage, so that she found herself in a state of the utmost wretchedness, harassed without by Uguccione, and plundered within by Lando de Agobolio. The friends of the king, and those who opposed Lando and his followers, were either of noble families, or the highest of the people, and all Guelphs, but their adversaries being in power they could not discover their minds without incurring the greatest danger. Being, however, determined to deliver themselves from such disgraceful tyranny, they secretly wrote to King Robert, requesting him to appoint for his vicar in Florence, Count Guido de Batifoli. The king complied, and the opposite party, although the seigneury were opposed to the king, on account of the good quality of the count, did not dare to resist him. Still his authority was not great, because the seigneury and gonfaloniers of the company were in favour of Lando and his party. During these troubles, the daughter of King Albert of Bohemia passed through Florence, in search of her husband, Charles, the son of King Robert, and was received with the greatest respect by the friends of the king, who complained to her of the unhappy state of the city, and of the tyranny of Lando and his partisans, so that through her influence and the exertions of the king's friends, the citizens were again united, and before her departure, Lando was stripped of all authority and sent back to Agobio, laden with blood and plunder. In reforming the government, the sovereignty of the city was continued to the king for another three years, and as there were then in office seven seniors of the party of Lando, six more were appointed of the king's friends, and some magistracies were composed of thirteen seniors, but not long afterward the number was reduced to seven, according to ancient custom. End of Book Two, Chapter Five Book Two, Chapter Six of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Book Two, Chapter Six War with Castruccio. Castruccio marches against Prato and retires without making any attempt. The emigrants, not being allowed to return, endeavour to enter the city by force, and are repulsed. Change in the mode of electing the great officers of state. The Squitini established. The Florentines, under Raymond of Cardona, are routed by Castruccio at Altopascio. Treacherous designs of Raymond. The Florentines give the sovereignty of the city to Charles, Duke of Cambria, who appoints the Duke of Athens for his vicar. The Duke of Calabria comes to Florence. The Emperor Louis of Bavaria visits Italy. The excitement he produces. Death of Castruccio and of Charles, Duke of Calabria. Reform of Government. 
About the same time, Uguccione lost the sovereignty of Lucca and of Pisa, and Castruccio Castracani, a citizen of Lucca, became lord of them, who, being a young man, bold and fierce, and fortunate in his enterprises, in a short time became head of the Ghibellines in Tuscany. On this account the discords among the Florentines were laid aside for some years, at first to abate the increasing power of Castruccio, and afterward to unite their means for mutual defence against him. And in order to give increased strength and efficacy to their counsels, the Signory appointed twelve citizens whom they called Buon Nomini, or Good Men, without whose advice and consent nothing of importance could be carried into effect. The conclusion of the sovereignty of King Robert being come, the citizens took the government into their own hands, reappointed the usual rectors and magistracies, and were kept united by the dread of Castruccio, who, after many efforts against the lords of Lunigiano, attacked Prato, to the relief of which the Florentines, having resolved to go, shut up their shops and houses, and proceeded thither in a body, amounting to twenty thousand foot and one thousand five hundred horse. And in order to reduce the number of Castruccio's friends and augment their own, the Signory declared that every rebel of the Guelphic party who should come to the relief of Prato would be restored to his country. They thus increased their army with an addition of four thousand men. This great force being quickly brought to Prato, alarmed Castruccio so much, that without trying the fortune of battle, he retired toward Lucca. Upon this, disturbances arose in the Florentine camp between the nobility and the people, the latter of whom wished to pursue the foe and destroy him, the former were for returning home, saying they had done enough for Prato in hazarding the safety of Florence on its account, which they did not regret under the circumstances, but now that necessity no longer existing, the propriety of further risk ceased also, as there was little to be gained and much to lose. Not being able to agree, the question was referred to the seniory, among whom the difference of opinion was equally great, and as the matter spread throughout the city, the people drew together, and used such threatening language against the nobility that they, being apprehensive for their safety, yielded, but the resolution being adopted too late, and many unwillingly, gave the enemy time to withdraw in safety to Lucca. This unfortunate circumstance made the people so indignant against the great, that the seigneury refused to perform the promise made to the exiles, and the latter, anticipating the fact, determined to be beforehand, and were at the gates of Florence to gain admittance into the city before the rest of the forces. But their design did not take effect, for their purpose being foreseen, they were repulsed by those who had remained at home. They then endeavoured to acquire by entreaty what they had failed to obtain by force, and sent eight men as ambassadors to the seigneury, to remind them of the promise given, and of the dangers they had undergone, in hope of the reward which had been held out to them. And although the nobility, who felt the obligation on account of their having particularly undertaken to fulfil the promise for which the seigneury had bound themselves, used their utmost exertion in favour of the exiles, so great was the anger of the multitude on account of their only partial success against Castruccio, that they could not obtain their admission. This occasioned costs and dishonour to the city, for many of the nobility, taking offence at this proceeding, endeavoured to obtain by arms that which had been refused to their prayers, and agreed with the exiles that they should come armed to the city, and that those within would arm themselves in their defence. But the affair was discovered before the appointed day arrived, so that those without found the city in arms, and prepared to resist them. So completely subdued were those without, that none dared to take arms, and thus the undertaking was abandoned, without any advantage having been obtained by the party. After the departure of the exiles it was determined to punish those who had been instrumental in bringing them to the city, but although every one knew who were the delinquents, none ventured to name, and still less to accuse them. It was, therefore, resolved that in order to come at the truth, every one should write the names of those he believed to be guilty, and present the writing secretly to the Capitano. By this means, Amerigo Donati, Tejegio, Frescobaldi, and Lotteringo Gerardini were accused, but the judges being more favourably disposed to them than perhaps their misdeeds deserved, each escaped by paying a fine. The tumults which arose in Florence from the comings of the rebels to the gates, showed that one leader was insufficient for the companies of the people. They therefore determined that in future each should have three or four, and to every gonfalier two or three penanieri, pennon-bearers, were added, so that if the whole body were not drawn out, a part might operate under one of them. And, as often happens in republics, after any disturbance, some old laws are annulled and others renewed, 
so on this occasion, as it had been previously customary to appoint the seniory for a time only, the then existing seniors and colleagues, feeling themselves possessed of sufficient power, assumed the authority to fix upon the seniors that would have to sit during the next forty months, by putting their names into a bag or purse, and drawing them every two months. But before the expiration of the forty months, many citizens were jealous that their names had not been deposited among the rest, and a new emborsation was made. From this beginning arose the custom of emborsing or enclosing the names of all who should take office in any of the magistracies for a long time to come, as well as those whose offices employed them within the city, as those abroad, though previously the councils of the retiring magistrates had elected those who were to succeed them. These emborsations were afterwards called squittini, or pollings, and it was thought that they would prevent much trouble to the city, and remove the cause of those tumults which every three or at most five years took place, upon the creation of magistrates, from the number of candidates for office. And not being able to adopt a better expedient, they made use of this, but did not observe the defects which lay concealed under such a trivial accommodation. In 1325, Castruccio, having taken possession of Pistoia, became so powerful that the Florentines, fearing his greatness, resolved before he should get himself firmly seated at his new conquest, to attack him and withdraw it from his authority. Of their citizens and friends they mustered an army amounting to twenty thousand foot and three thousand horse, and with this body encamped before Altopaccio, with the intention of taking the place, and thus preventing it from relieving Pistoia. Being successful in the first part of their design, they marched toward Lucca, and laid the country waste in their progress. But from the little prudence and less integrity of their leader, Romando di Cardona, they made but a small progress, for he, having observed them upon former occasions very prodigal of their liberty, placing it sometimes in the hands of a king, or persons of even inferior quality, thought if he could bring them into some difficulty, it might easily happen that they would make him their prince. Nor did he fail frequently to mention these matters, and required to have that authority in the city which had been given him over the army, endeavouring to show that otherwise he could not enforce the obedience requisite to a leader. As the Florentines did not consent to this, he wasted time, and allowed Castruccio to obtain the assistance which the Visconti and other tyrants of Lombardy had promised him, and thus became very strong. Romando, having willfully let the opportunity of victory pass away, now found himself unable to escape, for Castruccio coming up with him at Altopaccio, a great battle ensued, in which many citizens were slain and taken prisoners, and among the former fell Romando, who received from fortune that reward of bad faith and mischievous counsels which he had richly deserved from the Florentines. The injury they suffered from Castruccio, after the battle, in plunder, prisoners, destruction, and burning of property, is quite indescribable, for without any opposition, during many months, he led his predatory forces wherever he thought proper, and it seemed sufficient to the Florentines, if after such a terrible event, they could save their city. Still, they were not so absolutely cast down as to prevent them from raising great sums of money, hiring troops, and sending to their friends for assistance. But all they could do was insufficient to restrain such a powerful enemy, so that they were obliged to offer the sovereignty to Charles, Duke of Calabria, son of King Robert, if they could induce him to come to their defence. For these princes, being accustomed to rule Florence, preferred her obedience to her friendship. But Charles, being engaged in the wars of Sicily, and therefore unable to undertake the sovereignty of the city, sent in his stead Walter, by birth a Frenchman and Duke of Athens. He, as viceroy, took possession of the city, and appointed the magistrates according to his own pleasure. But his mode of proceeding was quite correct, and so completely contrary to his real nature, that every one respected him. The affairs of Sicily being composed, Charles came to Florence with a thousand horse. He made his entry into the city in July, 1326, and his coming prevented further pillage of the Florentine territory by Castruccio. However, the influence which they acquired without the city was lost within her walls, and the evils which they did not suffer from their enemies were brought upon them by their friends, for the seigneury could not do anything without the consent of the Duke of Calabria, who in the course of one year drew from the people four hundred thousand florins, although by the agreement entered into with him the sum was not to exceed two hundred thousand, so great were the burdens with which either himself or his father constantly oppressed them. To these troubles were added new jealousies and new enemies, for the Ghibellines of Lombardy became so alarmed upon the arrival of Charles in Tuscany that Galeazio Visconti and the other Lombard tyrants, by money and promises, 
induced Louis of Bavaria, who had lately been elected emperor contrary to the wish of the Pope, to come into Italy. After passing through Lombardy he entered Tuscany, and with the assistance of Castruccio made himself master of Pisa, from whence, having pacified with sums of money, he directed his course towards Rome. This caused the Duke of Calabria to be apprehensive for the safety of Naples. He therefore left Florence, and appointed as his viceroy Filippo de Saganetto. After the departure of the emperor, Castruccio made himself master of Pisa, but the Florentines, by a treaty with Pistoia, withdrew her from obedience to him. Castruccio then besieged Pistoia, and persevered with so much vigour and resolution, that although the Florentines often attempted to relieve her, by attacking first his army and then his country, they were unable, either by force or policy, to remove him, so anxious was he to punish the Pistolisi and subdue the Florentines. At length the people of Pistoia were compelled to receive him for their sovereign, but this event, although greatly to his glory, proved but little to his advantage, for upon his return to Lucca he died and as one event either of good or evil seldom comes alone, at Naples also died Charles, Duke of Calabria, and Lord of Florence, so that in a short time, beyond the exception of their most sanguine hopes, the Florentines found themselves delivered from the dominion of the one and the fear of the other. Being again free, they set about the reformation of the city, annulled all the old councils, and created two new ones, the one composed of three hundred citizens from the class of the people, the other of two hundred and fifty from the nobility and the people. The first was called the Council of the People, the other the Council of the Commune. End of Book 2, Chapter 6by Niccolò Machiavelli, translator unknown. Book Two, Chapter Seven. The Emperor at Rome. The Florentines refuse to purchase Lucca and repent of it. Enterprise of the Florentines. Conspiracy of the Bardi and the Frescobaldi. The conspiracy discovered and checked. Maffeo de Marati appeases the tumult. Lucca is purchased by the Florentines and taken by the Pisans. The Duke of Athens at Florence. The nobility determined to make him prince of the city. The emperor, being arrived at Rome, created an antipope, who did many things in opposition to the church, and attempted many others, but without effect, so that at last he retired with disgrace and went to Pisa, where, either because they were not paid or from disaffection, about eight hundred German horse mutinied, and fortified themselves at Montechiaro on the Ceruglio, and when the emperor had left Pisa to go to Lombardy, they took possession of Lucca and drove out Francesco Castracani, whom he had left there. Designing to turn their conquest to account, they offered it to the Florentines for eighty thousand florins, which, by the advice of Simon de la Tosa, was refused. This resolution, if they had remained in it, would have been of the greatest utility to the Florentines, but as they shortly afterward changed their minds, it became pernicious, for although at the time they might have attained peaceful possession of her for a small sum, and would not, they afterwards wished to have her and could not, even for a much larger amount which caused many and most hurtful changes to take place in Florence. Luca, being refused by the Florentines, was purchased by Girodino Spinoli, a Genoese, for thirty thousand florins. And as men are often less anxious to take what is in their power than desirous of that which they cannot attain, as soon as the purchase of Girodino became known, and for how small a sum it had been bought, the people of Florence were seized with an extreme desire to have it, blaming themselves and those by whose advice they had been induced to reject the offer made to them. And in order to obtain by force what they had refused to purchase, they sent troops to plunder and overrun the country of the Lucese. About this time the emperor left Italy. The antipope, by means of the Pisans, became a prisoner in France, and the Florentines, from the death of Castruccio, which occurred in 1328, remained in domestic peace until 1340, and gave their undivided attention to external affairs, while many wars were carried on in Lombardy, occasioned by the coming of John, King of Bohemia, and in Tuscany on account of Lucca. During this period Florence was ornamented with many new buildings, and by the advice of Giotto, the most distinguished painter of his time, they built the tower of Santa Reparata. Besides this, the waters of the Arno having, in 1333, risen twelve feet above their ordinary level, destroyed some of the bridges and many buildings, 
all of which were restored with great care and expense. In the year 1340, new sources of disagreement arose. The great had two ways of increasing or preserving their power, the one so to restrain the emborsation of magistrates, that the lot always fell upon themselves or their friends, the other that having the election of the rectors, they were always favourable to their party. The second mode they considered of so great importance, that the ordinary rectors not being sufficient for them, they on some occasions elected a third, and at this time they had made an extraordinary appointment, under the title of Captain of the Guard, of Jacopo Gabrielli of Agobio, and endowed him with unlimited authority over the citizens. This man, under the sanction of those who governed, committed constant outrages, and among those whom he injured were Piero di Bardi and Bardo Frescobaldi. These, being of the nobility, and naturally proud, could not endure that a stranger, supported by a few powerful men, should without cause injure them with impunity, and consequently entered into a conspiracy against him and those by whom he was supported. They were joined by many noble families, and in some of the people, who were offended with the tyranny of those in power. Their plan was, that each should bring into his house a number of armed men, and on the morning after the day of all saints, when almost all would be in the temples praying for their dead, they should take arms, kill the capitano, and those who were at the head of affairs, and then, with a new scenery and new ordinances, reform the government. But as the more dangerous a business is considered, the less willingly it is undertaken, it commonly happens, when there is any time allowed between the determining upon a perilous enterprise and its execution, that the conspiracy, by one means or another, becomes known. Andrea de Bardi was one of the conspirators, and upon reconsideration of the matter, the fear of the punishment operated more powerfully upon him than the desire of revenge, and he disclosed the affair to Jacopo Alberti, his brother-in-law. Jacopo acquainted the priors, and they informed the government. And as the danger was near, All Saints' Day being just at hand, many citizens met together in the palace, and thinking their peril increased by delay, they insisted that the seigneury should order the alarm to be rung, and called the people together in arms. Taldo Valori was at this time Gonfalonier, and Francesco Salviati one of the seigneury, who, being relatives of the Bardi, were unwilling to summon the people with the bell, alleging as a reason that it is by no means well to assemble them in arms upon every slight occasion, for power put into the hands of an unrestrained multitude was never beneficial, that it is an easy manner to excite them to violence, but a more difficult thing to restrain them, and that therefore it would be a more prudent course if they were to inquire into the truth of the affair, and punish the delinquents by the civil authority, than to attempt, upon a single information, to correct it by such a tumultuous means, and thus hazard the safety of the city. None would listen to these remarks. The scenery were assailed with insolent behaviour and indecent expressions, and compelled to sound the alarm, upon which the people presently assembled in arms. On the other hand, the Bardi and the Frescobaldi, finding themselves discovered, that they might conquer with glory or die without shame, armed themselves, in the hope that they would be able to defend that part of the city beyond the river, where their houses were situated, and they fortified the bridge in expectation of assistance, which they expected from the nobles and their friends in the country. Their design was frustrated by the people who, in common with themselves, occupied this part of the city, for these took arms in favour of the seigneury, so that seeing themselves thus circumstanced, they abandoned the bridges, and betook themselves to the street in which the Bardi resided, as being a stronger situation than in any other, and this they defended with great bravery. Jacopo d'Agobio, knowing the whole conspiracy was directed against himself, in fear of death, terrified and vanquished, kept himself surrounded with forces near the palace of the seigneury, but the other rectors, who were much less blamable, discovered greater courage, and especially the podesta or provost, whose name was Maffeo de Morati. He presented himself among the combatants without any fear, and passing the bridge of the Rubicante, amid the swords of the Bardi, made a sign that he wished to speak to them. Upon this, their reverence for the man, his noble demeanour, and the excellent qualities he was known to possess, caused an immediate cessation of the combat, and induced them to listen to him patiently. He very gravely, but without the use of any bitter or aggravating expressions, blamed their conspiracy, showed the danger they would incur if they still contended against the popular feeling, gave them reason to hope their complaints would be heard, and mercifully considered, and promised that he himself would use his endeavours in their behalf. He then returned to the seigneury, and implored them to spare the blood of the citizens, 
showing the impropriety of judging them unheard, and at length induced them to consent that the Bardi and the Frescobaldi, with their friends, should leave the city, and without impediment be allowed to retire to their castles. Upon their departure the people being again disarmed, the signory proceeded against those only of the Bardi and Frescobaldi families who had taken arms. To lessen their power, they bought of the Bardi the castle of Mangona and that of Vernia, and enacted a law which provided that no citizen should be allowed to possess a castle or fortified place within twenty miles of Florence. After a few months, Stiata Frescobaldi was beheaded, and many of his family banished. Those who governed, not satisfied with having subdued the Bardi and the Frescobaldi, as is most commonly the case, the more authority they possessed the worse use they made of it, and the more insolent they became. As they had hitherto one captain of the guard who afflicted the city, they now appointed another for the country, with unlimited authority, to the end that those whom they suspected might abide neither within nor without. And they excited them to such excesses against the whole of the nobility, that these were driven to desperation, and ready to sell both themselves and the city to obtain a revenge. The occasion at length came, and they did not fail to use it. The troubles of Tuscany and Lombardy had brought the city of Lucca under the role of Massino della Scala, lord of Verona, who, though bound by contract to assign her to the Florentines, had refused to do so, for, being lord of Parma, he thought he should be able to retain her, and did not trouble himself about his breach of faith. Upon this the Florentines joined the Venetians, and with their assistance brought Mastino to the brink of ruin. They did not, however, derive any benefit from this beyond the slight satisfaction of having conquered him, for the Venetians, who, like all who enter into league with less powerful states than themselves, having acquired Trevigi and Vincenza, made peace with Mastino, without the least regard for the Florentines. Shortly after this, the Visconti, lords of Milan, having taken Parma from Mastino, he found himself unable to retain Lucca, and therefore determined to sell it. The competitors for the purchase were the Florentines and the Pisans, and in the course of the treaty the Pisans, finding that the Florentines, being richer people, were about to obtain it, had recourse to arms, and with the assistance of the Visconti marched against Lucca. The Florentines did not, on that account, withdraw from the purchase, but having agreed upon the terms with Mastino, paid part of the money, gave security for the remainder, and sent Nato Rucchelli, Giovanni de Bardini de Medici, and Rosso de Riccardi de Ricci, to take possession, who entered Lucca by force, and Mastino's people delivered the city to them. Nevertheless, the Pisans continued the siege, and the Florentines used their utmost endeavors to relieve her, but after a long war, loss of money, and accumulation of disgrace, they were compelled to retire, and the Pisans became lords of Lucca. The loss of this city, as in like cases commonly happens, exasperated the people of Florence against the members of the government. At every street corner and public place they were openly censured, and the entire misfortune was laid to the charge of their greediness and mismanagement. At the beginning of the war, twenty citizens had been appointed to undertake the direction of it, who appointed Malatesta de Romini to the command of the forces. He having exhibited little zeal and less prudence, they requested assistance from Robert, King of Naples, and he sent them Walter, Duke of Athens, who, as Providence would have it, to bring about the approaching evils, arrived at Florence just at the moment when the undertaking against Lucca had entirely failed. Upon this the twenty, seeing the anger of the people, thought to inspire them with fresh hopes by appointment of a new leader, and thus remove, or at least abate, the causes of calumny against themselves. As there was much to be feared, and that the Duke of Athens might have greater authority to defend them, they first chose him for their coadjutor, and then appointed him to the command of the army. The nobility, who were discontented from the causes above mentioned, having many of them been acquainted with Walter, when upon a former occasion he had governed Florence for the Duke of Calabria, thought they had now an opportunity, though with the ruin of the city, subduing of their enemies, for there was no means of prevailing against those who had oppressed them, but of submitting to the authority of a prince who, being acquainted with the worth of one party and the insolence of the other, would restrain the latter and reward the former. To this they added a hope of the benefits they might derive from him when he had acquired the principality by their means. They therefore took several occasions of being with him secretly, and entreated he would take the command wholly upon himself, offering him the utmost assistance in their power. To their influence and entreaty were added also those of some families of the people. These were the Peruzzi, Accia Giuli, Antalesi, and Buonacorsi, 
who, being overwhelmed with debts, and without means of their own, wished for those of others to liquidate them, and by the slavery of their country to deliver themselves from their servitude to their creditors. These demonstrations excited the ambitious mind of the duke to greater desire of dominion, and in order to gain himself the reputation of strict equity and justice, and thus increase his favour with the plebeians, he prosecuted those who had conducted the war against Luca, condemned many to pay fines, others to exile, and put to death Giovanni de' Medici, Nado Rucile, and Guillermo Atoviti. End of Book Two, Chapter Seven. Book Two, Chapter Eight of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book 2, Chapter 8. The Duke of Athens requires to be made Prince of Florence. The Signory address the Duke upon the subject. The plebeians proclaim him Prince of Florence for life tyrannical proceedings of the duke, the city disgusted with him, conspiracies against the duke, the duke discovers the conspiracies and becomes terrified, the city rises against him, he is besieged in the palace, measures adopted by the citizens for reform of the government, the duke is compelled to withdraw from the city, miserable deaths of Guglielmo d'Ascesi and his son, departure of the duke of athens his character these executions greatly terrified the middle class of citizens but gave satisfaction to the great and to the plebeians to the latter because it is their nature to delight in evil and to the former by thus seeing themselves avenged of the many wrongs they had suffered from the people when the duke passed along the streets he was hailed with loud cheers the boldness of his proceedings was praised and both parties joined in open entreaties that he would search out the faults of the citizens and punish them the office of the twenty began to fall into disuse while the power of the duke became great and the influence of fear excessive so that every one in order to appear friendly to him caused his arms to be painted over their houses, and the name alone was all he needed to be absolutely prince. Thinking himself upon such a footing that he might safely attempt anything, he gave the seigneury to understand that he judged it necessary for the good of the city that the sovereignty should be freely given to him, and that, as the rest of the citizens were willing that it should be so, he desired they would also consent. The seigneury, notwithstanding many had foreseen the ruin of their country, were much disturbed at this demand, and although they were aware of the dangerous position in which they stood, that they might not be wanting in their duty, resolutely refused to comply. The duke had, in order to assume a greater appearance of religion and humanity, chosen for his residence the convent of the minor canons of St. Croce, and in order to carry his evil designs into effect, proclaimed that all the people should, on the following morning, present themselves before him in the piazza of the convent. This command alarmed the seigneury much more than his discourse to them had done, and they consulted with those citizens whom they thought most attached to their country and to liberty. But they could not devise any better plan, knowing the power of which the duke was possessed, than to endeavor by entreaty to induce him either to forego his design or to make his government less intolerable. A party of them was, therefore, appointed to wait upon him, one of whom addressed him in the following manner. We appear before you, my lord, induced first by the demand which you have made, and then by the orders you have given for a meeting of the people. For it appears to us very clearly that it is your intention to effect by extraordinary means the design from which we have hitherto withheld our consent. It is not, however, our intention to oppose you with force, but only to show what a heavy charge you take upon yourself, and the dangerous course you adopt. 
to the end that you may remember our advice and that of those who not by consideration of what is beneficial for you but for the gratification of their own unreasonable wishes have advised you differently you are endeavoring to reduce to slavery a city that has always existed in freedom for the authority which we have at times conceded to the kings of naples was companionship and not servitude have you considered the mighty things which the name of liberty implies to such a city as this and how delightful it is to those who hear it it has a power which nothing can subdue time cannot wear away nor can any degree of merit in a prince countervail the loss of it consider my lord how great the force must be that can keep a city like this in subjection no foreign aid would enable you to do it neither can you confide in those at home for they who are at present your friends and advise you to adopt the course you now pursue as soon as with your assistance they have overcome their enemies will at once turn their thoughts towards effecting your destruction and then take the government upon themselves the plebeians in whom you confide will change upon any accident however trivial so that in a very short time you may expect to see the whole city opposed to you which will produce both their ruin and your own nor will you be able to find any remedy for this for princes who have but few enemies may make their government very secure by the death or banishment of those who are opposed to them but when the hatred is universal no security whatever can be found for you cannot tell from what direction the evil may commence and he who has to apprehend every man his enemy cannot make himself assured of any one and if you should attempt to secure a friend or two you would only increase the dangers of your situation for the hatred of the rest would be increased by your success and they would become more resolutely disposed to vengeance that time can neither destroy nor abate the desire for freedom is most certain for it has been often observed that those have reassumed their liberty who in their own persons had never tasted of its charms and love it only from remembrance of what they have heard their fathers relate and therefore when recovered have preserved it with indomitable resolution and at every hazard and even when their fathers could not remember it the public buildings the halls of the magistracy and the insignia of free institutions remind them of it and these things cannot fail to be known and greatly desired by every class of citizens what is it you imagine you can do that would be an equivalent for the sweets of liberty or make men lose their desire of their present conditions no if you were to join the whole of tuscany to the florentine rule if you were to return to the city daily and triumph over her enemies what could it avail the glory would not be ours but yours we should not acquire fellow-citizens but partakers of our bondage who would serve to sink us still deeper in ignominy and if your conduct were in every respect upright your demeanor amiable and your judgments equitable all these would be insufficient to make you beloved if you imagine otherwise you deceive yourself for to one accustomed to the enjoyment of liberty the slightest chains feel heavy and every tie upon his free soul oppresses him besides it is impossible to find a violent people associated with a good prince for of necessity they must soon become alike or their difference produce the ruin of one of them you may therefore be assured that you will either have to hold this city by force to effect which guards castles and external aid have oft been found insufficient or be content with the authority we have conferred and this we would advise reminding you that no dominion can be durable to which the governed do not consent and we have no wish to lead you blinded by ambition to such a point that unable either to stand or advance you must to the great injury of both or necessity fall this discourse did not in the slightest degree soften the obdurate mind of the duke who replied that it was not his intention to rob the city of her liberty but to restore it to her for those cities alone are in slavery that are disunited while the united are free 
as florence by her factions and ambition had deprived herself of liberty he should restore not take it from her and as he had been induced to take this charge upon himself not from his own ambition but at the entreaty of a great number of citizens they would do well to be satisfied with that which produced contentment among the rest with regard to the danger he might incur he thought nothing of it for it was not the part of a good man to avoid doing good from his apprehension of evil and it was the part of a coward to shun a glorious undertaking because some uncertainty attended the success of the attempt and he knew he should so conduct himself that they would soon see they had entertained great apprehensions and been in a little danger the seigneury then agreed finding they could not do better that on the following morning the people should be assembled in their accustomed place of meeting and with their consent the seigneury should confer upon the duke the sovereignty of the city for one year on the same conditions as it had been entrusted to the duke of calabria it was upon the eighth of november thirteen forty two when the duke accompanied by giovanni della tosa and all his confederates with many other citizens came to the piazza or court of the palace and having with the seigneury mounted upon the ringhiera or rostrum as the florentines call those steps which lead to the palace the agreement which had been entered into between the seigneury and himself was read when they had come to the passage which gave the government to him for one year the people shouted for life upon this francesco rusticelli one of the signory arose to speak and endeavored to abate the tumult and procure a hearing but the mob with their hootings prevented him from being heard by any one so that with the consent of the people the duke was elected not for one year merely but for life he was then borne through the piazza by the crowd, shouting his name as they proceeded. It is the custom that he who is appointed to the guard of palace shall, in the absence of the seigneury, remain locked within. This office was at the time held by Rinieri di Giotto, who, bribed by the friends of the duke, without waiting for any force, admitted him immediately the seigneury terrified and dishonored retired to their own houses the palace was plundered by the followers of the duke the gonfalon of the people torn to pieces and the arms of the duke placed over the palace all this happened to the indescribable sorrow of good men though to the satisfaction of those who either from ignorance or malignity were consenting parties the duke having acquired the sovereignty of the city in order to strip those of all authority who had been defenders of her liberty forbade the seigneury to assemble in the palace and appointed a private dwelling for their use he took their colors from the gonfalonier of the companies of the people abolished the ordinances made for the restraint of the great set at liberty those who were imprisoned recalled the bardi and the frescobaldi from exile and forbade every one from carrying arms about his person in order the better to defend himself against those within the city he made friends of all he could around it and therefore conferred great benefits upon the aretini and other subjects of the florentines he made peace with the pisans although raised to power in order that he might carry on war against them ceased paying interest to those merchants who during the war against lucca had lent money to the republic increased the old taxes levied new ones and took from the seigneury all authority his rectors were baglione da perugia and guglielmo da scesi who with cerrettieri bisdomini were the persons with whom he consulted on public affairs he imposed burdensome taxes upon the citizens his decisions between contending parties were unjust and that precision and humanity which he had at first assumed became cruelty and pride so that many of the greatest citizens and noblest people were either by fines death or some new invention grievously oppressed and in completing the same bad system both without the city and within he appointed six rectors for the country who beat and plundered the inhabitants he suspected the great although he had been benefited by them and had restored many to their country 
for he felt assured that the generous minds of the nobility would not allow them from any motives to submit contentedly to his authority he also began to confer benefits and advantages upon the lowest orders thinking that with their assistance and the arms of foreigners he would be able to preserve the tyranny the month of may during which feasts are held being come he caused many companies to be formed of the plebeians and very lowest of the people and to these dignified with splendid titles he gave colors and money and while one party went into bacchanalian procession through the city others were stationed in different parts of it to receive them as guests as the report of the duke's authority spread abroad many of french origin came to him for all of whom he found offices and emoluments as if they had been the most trustworthy of men so that in a short time florence became not only subject to french dominion but adopted their dress and manners for men and women without regard to propriety or sense of shame imitated them but that which disgusted the people most completely was the violence which without any distinction of quality or rank he and his followers committed upon the women the people were filled with indignation seeing the majesty of the state overturned its ordinances annihilated its laws annulled and every decent regulation sat at naught for men unaccustomed to royal pomp could not endure to see this man surrounded with his armed satellites on foot and on horseback and having now a closer view of their disgrace they were compelled to honor him whom they in the highest degree hated to this hatred was added the terror occasioned by the continual imposition of new taxes and frequent shedding of blood with which he impoverished and consumed the city the duke was not unaware of these impressions existing strongly in the people's minds nor was he without fear of the consequences but still pretended to think himself beloved and when matteo di morozzo either to acquire his favor or to free himself from danger gave information that the family of the medici and some others had entered into a conspiracy against him he not only did not inquire into the matter but caused the informer to be put to a cruel death this mode of proceeding restrained those who were disposed to acquaint him of his danger and gave additional courage to such as sought his ruin bertone cini having ventured to speak against the taxes with which the people were loaded had his tongue cut out with such barbarous cruelty as to cause his death this shocking act increased the people's rage and their hatred of the duke for those who were accustomed to discourse and to act upon every occasion with the greatest boldness could not endure to live with their hands tied and forbidden to speak this oppression increased to such a degree that not merely the florentines who though unable to preserve their city cannot endure slavery but the most servile people on earth would have been roused to attempt the recovery of freedom and consequently many citizens of all ranks resolved either to deliver themselves from this odious tyranny or die in the attempt three distinct conspiracies were formed one of the great another of the people and the third of the working classes each of which besides the general causes which operated upon the whole were excited by some other particular grievance the great found themselves deprived of all participation in the government the people had lost the power they possessed and the artificers saw themselves deficient in the usual remuneration of their labor agnolo acciaioli was at this time archbishop of florence and by his discourses had formerly greatly favored the duke and procured him many followers among the higher class of the people but when he found him lord of the city and became acquainted with his tyrannical mode of proceeding it appeared to him that he had misled his countryman and to correct the evil he had done he saw no other course but to attempt the cure by the means which he had caused it he therefore became the leader of the first and most powerful conspiracy and was joined by the bardi rossi frescobaldi scali altoviti magalotti strozzi and mancini of the second the principals were manno and corso donati and with them the pazzi caviciulli cerchi and albizzi of the third 
the first was antonio adimari and with him the medici bordini ruccellai and aldobrandini it was the intention of these last to slay him in the house of the albizzi whither he was expected to go on st john's day to see the horses run but he not having gone their design did not succeed they then resolved to attack him as he rode through the city but they found this would be very difficult for he was always accompanied with a considerable armed force and never took the same route twice together so that they had no certainty of where to find him they had a design of slaying him in the council although they knew that if he were dead they would be at the mercy of his followers while these matters were being considered by the conspirators antonio adimari in expectation of getting assistance from them disclosed the affair to some sienese his friends naming certain of the conspirators and assuring them that the whole city was ready to rise at once one of them communicated the matter to francesco brunelleschi not with a design to injure the plot but in the hope that he would join them francesco either from personal fear or private hatred of some one revealed the whole to the duke whereupon pagolo del mazzega and simon da monterapolli were taken who acquainted him with the number and quality of the conspirators this terrified him and he was advised to request their presence rather than to take them prisoners for if they fled he might without disgrace secure himself by banishment of the rest he therefore sent for antonio adimari who confining in his companions appeared immediately and was detained francesco brunelleschi and uguccione bondelmonti advised the duke to take as many of the conspirators prisoners as he could and put them to death but he thinking his strength unequal to his foes did not adopt this course but took another which had it succeeded would have freed him from his enemies and increased his power it was the custom of the duke to call the citizens together upon some occasions and advised with them he therefore having first sent to collect forces from without made a list of three hundred citizens and gave it to his messengers with orders to assemble them under the pretence of public business and having drawn them together it was his intention either to put them to death or imprison them the capture of antonio adimari and the sending for forces which could not be kept secret alarmed the citizens and more particularly those who were in the plot so that the boldest of them refused to attend and as each had read the list they sought each other and resolved to rise at once and die like men with arms in their hands rather than be led like calves to the slaughter in a very short time the chief conspirators became known to each other and resolved that the next day which was the twenty sixth july thirteen forty three they would raise a disturbance in the old market-place then arm themselves and call the people to freedom the next morning being come at nine o'clock according to agreement they took arms and at the call of liberty assembled each party in its own district under the ensigns and with the arms of the people which had been secretly provided by the conspirators all the heads of families as well as the nobility as of the people met together and swore to stand in each other's defence and effect the death of the duke except some of the bondelmonti and of the cavalcanti with those four families of the people which had taken so conspicuous a part in making him sovereign and the butchers with others the lowest of the plebeians who met armed in the piazza in his favour the duke immediately fortified the place and ordered those of his people who were lodged in different parts of the city to mount upon horseback and join those in the court but on their way thither many were attacked and slain however about three hundred horse assembled and the duke was in doubt whether he should come forth and meet the enemy or defend himself within on the other hand the medici 
Caviciulli, Rucellai, and other families who had been most injured by him, fearful that if he came forth, many of those who had taken arms against them would discover themselves his partisans, in order to deprive him of the occasion of attacking them and increasing the number of his friends, took the lead and assailed the palace. Upon this, those families of the people who had declared for the duke, seeing themselves boldly attacked, changed their minds and all took part with the citizens, except Uguccione Bondelmonti, who retired into the palace, and Gianotto Cavalcanti, who, having withdrawn with some of his followers to the new market, mounted upon a bench and begged that those who were going in arms to the piazza would take the part of the duke. In order to terrify them, he exaggerated the number of his people, and threatened all with death who should obstinately persevere in their undertaking against their sovereign. But not finding any one either to follow him or to chastise his insolence, and seeing his labor fruitless, he withdrew to his own house. In the meantime, the contest in the piazza between the people and the forces of the duke was very great, but although the palace served them for defense, they were overcome, some yielding to the enemy, and others quitting their horses, fled within the walls. While this was going on, Corso and Amerigo Donati, with a part of the people, broke open the stinke, or prisons, burnt the papers of the provost and of the public chamber, pillaged the houses of the rectors, and slew all who had held offices under the duke whom they could find. The duke, finding the piazza in possession of his enemies, the city opposed to him, and without any hope of assistance, endeavored by an act of clemency to recover the favor of the people, having caused those whom he had made prisoners to be brought before him with amiable and kindly expressions, he set them at liberty, and made Antonio Adimari a knight, although quite against his will. He caused his own arms to be taken down, and those of the people to be replaced over the palace, but these things coming out of season and forced by his necessities did him little good. He remained, notwithstanding all he did, besieged in the palace, and saw that having aimed at too much he had lost all, and would most likely, after a few days, die either of hunger or by the weapons of his enemies. The citizens assembled in the church of Santa Reparata to form the new government, and appointed fourteen citizens, half from the nobility and half from the people, who, with the archbishop, were invested with full authority to remodel the state of Florence. They also elected six others to take upon them the duties of provost, till he who should be finally chosen took office, the duties of which were usually performed by a subject of some neighboring state. Many had come to Florence in defense of the people, among whom were a party from Siena, with six ambassadors, men of high consideration in their own country. These endeavored to bring the people and the duke to terms, but the former refused to listen to any whatever, unless Guglielmo d'Ascesi and his son, with Cerattieri Bisdomini, were first given up to them. The duke would not consent to this, but, being threatened by those who were shut up with him, he was forced to comply. The rage of men is certainly always found greater, and their revenge more furious upon the recovery of liberty, than when it has only been defended. Guglielmo and his son were placed among the thousands of their enemies, and the latter was not yet eighteen years old. Neither his beauty, his innocence, nor his youth could save him from the fury of the multitude, but both were instantly slain. Those who could not wound them while alive wounded them after they were dead, and not satisfied with tearing them to pieces, they hewed their bodies with swords, tore them with their hands, and even with their teeth, and that every sense might be satiated with vengeance, having first heard their moans, seen their wounds, and touched their lacerated bodies, they wished even the stomach to be satisfied, that having glutted their external senses, the one within might also have its share. This rabid fury, however hurtful to the father and son, was favorable to Cerettieri, for the multitude, wearied with their cruelty toward the former, quite forgot him, so that he, not being asked for, remained in the palace, and during night was conveyed safely away by his friends. 
the rage of the multitude being appeased by their blood an agreement was made that the duke and his people with whatever belonged to him should quit the city in safety that he should renounce all claim of whatever kind upon florence and that upon his arrival in the casentino he would ratify his renunciation on the sixth of august he set out accompanied by many citizens and having arrived at the casentino he ratified the agreement although unwillingly and he would not have kept his word if count simon had not threatened to take him back to florence this duke as his proceedings testified was cruel and avaricious difficult to speak with and haughty in reply he desired the service of men not the cultivation of their better feelings and strove rather to inspire them with fear than love nor was his person less despicable than his manners he was short his complexion was black and he had a long thin beard he was thus in every respect contemptible and at the end of ten months his misconduct deprived him of the sovereignty which the evil counsel of others had given him. End of Book 2 Chapter 8「Book 2 Chapter 9 of History of Florence」this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of florence and of the affairs of italy volume 1 by niccolo machiavelli translator unknown book 2 chapter 9 many cities and territories subject to the florentines rebel prudent conduct adopted upon this occasion the city is divided into quarters, disputes between the nobility and the people, the bishop endeavors to reconcile them but does not succeed, the government reformed by the people, riot of Andrea Strozzi, serious disagreements between the nobility and the people, they come to arms and the nobility are subdued, the plague in Florence of which Boccaccio speaks. These events taking place in the city induced all the dependencies of the Florentine state to throw off their yoke, so that Arezzo, Castiglione, Pistoia, Volterra, Colle, and San Gimignano rebelled. Thus Florence found herself deprived of both her tyrant and her dominions at the same moment, and in recovering her liberty taught her subjects how they might become free. The duke being expelled and the territories lost, the fourteen citizens and the bishop thought it would be better to act kindly towards their subjects in peace than to make them enemies by war, and to show a desire that their subjects should be free as well as themselves. They, therefore, sent ambassadors to the people of Arezzo to renounce all dominion over that city and to enter into a treaty with them, to the end that as they could not retain them as subjects they might make use of them as friends they also in the best manner they were able agreed with the other places that they should retain their freedom and that being free they might mutually assist each other in the preservation of their liberties this prudent course was attended with a most favorable result for arezzo not many years afterward returned to the florentine rule and the other places in the course of a few months returned to their former obedience thus it frequently occurs that we sooner attain our ends by a seeming indifferent to them than by more obstinate pursuit having settled external affairs they now turned to the consideration of those within the city and after some altercation between the nobility and the people, it was arranged that the nobility should form one-third of the seigneury and fill one-half of the other offices. The city was, as we have before shown, divided into sixths, and hence there would be six seigneurs, one for each sixth, except when, from some more than ordinary cause, there had been twelve or thirteen created. But when this had occurred, they were again soon reduced to six. It now seemed desirable to make an alteration in this respect, as well because the six were not properly divided, as that, wishing to give their proportion to the great, it became desirable to increase the number. 
they therefore divided the city into quarters and for each created three seigneurs they abolished the office of gonfalonier of justice and also the gonfalonier of the companies of the people and instead of the twelve buonuomini or good men created eight councillors four from each party the government having been established in this manner, the city might have been in repose if the great had been content to live in that moderation which civil society requires. But they produced a contrary result, for those out of office would not conduct themselves as citizens, and those who were in government wished to be lords, so that every day furnished some new instance of their insolence and pride these things were very grievous to the people and they began to regret that for one tyrant put down they had sprung up a thousand the arrogance of one party and the anger of the other rose to such a degree that the heads of the people complained to the bishop of the improper conduct of the nobility and what unfit associates they had become for the people and begged he would endeavor to induce them to be content with their share of administration in the other offices, and leave the magistracy of the seigneury wholly to themselves. The bishop was naturally a well-meaning man, but his want of firmness rendered him easily influenced. Hence, at the instance of his associates, he at first favored the Duke of Athens, and afterward, by the advice of other citizens, conspired against him. At the reformation of the government he had favored the nobility, and now he appeared to incline toward the people, moved by the reasons which they had advanced. Thinking to find in others the same instability of purpose, he endeavored to effect an amicable arrangement. With this design he called together the fourteen who were yet in office, and in the best terms he could imagine, advised them to give up the seigneury to the people, in order to secure the peace of the city and assured them that if they refused ruin would most probably be the result the discourse excited the anger of the nobility to the highest pitch and ridolfo de bardi reproved him in unmeasured terms as a man of little faith reminding him of his friendship for the duke to prove the duplicity of his present conduct and saying that in driving him away he had acted the part of a traitor he concluded by telling him that the honors they had acquired at their own peril they would at their own peril defend they then left the bishop and in great wrath informed their associates in the government and all the families of the nobility of what had been done the people also expressed their thoughts to each other and as the nobility made preparations for the defense of the seigneurs they determined not to wait till they had perfected their arrangements and therefore being armed hastened to the palace shouting as they went along that the nobility must give up their share in the government the uproar and excitement were astonishing the seigneurs of the nobility found themselves abandoned, for their friends, seeing all the people in arms, did not dare to rise in their defense, but each kept within his own house. The seigneurs of the people endeavored to abate the excitement of the multitude by affirming their associates to be good and moderate men, but, not succeeding in their attempt to avoid a greater evil, sent them home to their houses, whither they were with difficulty conducted. The nobility having left the palace, the office of the four councillors was taken from their party and conferred upon twelve of the people. To the eight seigneurs who remained, a gonfalonier of justice was added, and sixteen gonfaloniers of the companies of the people, and the council was so reformed that the government remained wholly in the hands of the popular party. At the times these events took place, there was a great scarcity in the city, and discontent prevailed both among the highest and the lowest classes, in the latter for want of food, and in the former from having lost their power in the state. This circumstance induced Andrea Strozzi to think of making himself sovereign of the city. Selling his corn at a lower price than others did, a great many people flocked to his house emboldened by the sight of these he one morning mounted his horse and followed by a considerable number called the people to arms and in a short time drew together about four thousand men with whom he proceeded to the seigneury and demanded that the gates of the palace should be opened 
but the signors by threats and the force which they retained in the palace drove them from the court and then by proclamation so terrified them that they gradually dropped off and returned to their homes and andrea finding himself alone with some difficulty escaped falling into the hands of the magistrates this event although an act of great temerity and attended with the result that usually follows such attempts raised a hope in the minds of the nobility of overcoming the people seeing that the lowest of the plebeians were at enmity with them and to profit by this circumstance they resolved to arm themselves and with justifiable force recover those rights of which they had been unjustly deprived their minds acquired such an assurance of success that they openly provided themselves with arms fortified their houses and even sent to their friends in lombardy for assistance the people and the seigneury made preparation for their defence and requested aid from perugia and siena so that the city was filled with the armed followers of either party the nobility on this side of the arno divided themselves into three parts the one occupied the houses of the Caviciulli near the church of St. John, another the houses of the Pazzi and the Donati near the great church of St. Peter, and the third those of the Cavalcanti in the New Market. Those beyond the river fortified the bridges and the streets in which their houses stood. The Nerli defended the bridge of the Caffraia, the Frescobaldi and the Manelli, the church of the Holy Trinity, and the Rossi and the Bardi, the bridge of the Rubaconte and the Old Bridge. The people were drawn together under the gonfalon of justice and the ensigns of the companies of the artisans. Both sides being thus arranged in order of battle, the people thought it imprudent to defer the contest and the attack was commenced by the medici and the rondinelli who assailed the caviciulli where the houses of the latter opened upon the piazza of st john here both parties contended with great obstinacy and were mutually wounded from the towers by stones and other missiles and from below by arrows they fought for three hours but the forces of the people continuing to increase and the caviciulli finding themselves overcome by numbers and hopeless of other assistance submitted themselves to the people who saved their houses and property and having disarmed them ordered them to disperse among their relatives and friends and remain unarmed being victorious in the first attack they easily overpowered the pazzi and the donati whose numbers were less than those they had subdued so that there only remained on this side of the arno the cavalcanti who were strong both in respect of the post they had chosen and in their followers nevertheless seeing all the gonfalons against them and that the others had been overcome by three gonfalons alone they yielded without offering much resistance three parts of the city were now in the hands of the people and only one in possession of the nobility but this was the strongest as well on account of those who held it as from its situation being defended by the arno hence it was first necessary to force the bridges the old bridge was first assailed and offered a brave resistance for the towers were armed and the streets barricaded and the barricades defended by the most resolute men so that the people were repulsed with great loss finding their labor at this point fruitless they endeavored to force the rubaconte bridge but no better success resulting they left four gonfalons in charge of the two bridges and with the others attacked the bridge of the caraya here although the nerli defended themselves like brave men they could not resist the fury of the people for this bridge having no towers was weaker than the others and was attacked by the caponi and many families of the people who lived in that vicinity being thus assailed on all sides they abandoned the barricades and gave way to the people who then overcame the rossi and the frescobaldi for all those beyond the arno took part with the conquerors there was now no resistance made except by the bardi who remained undaunted notwithstanding the failure of their friends the union of the people against them and the little chance of success which they seemed to have they resolved to die fighting and rather see their houses burned and plundered than submit to the power of their enemies they defended themselves with such obstinacy that many fruitless attempts were made to overcome them both at the old bridge and the rubaconte but their foes were always repulsed with loss 
there had in former times been a street which led between the houses of the pitti from the roman road to the walls upon mount st george by this way the people sent six gonfalons with orders to assail their houses from behind this attack overcame the resolution of the bardi and decided the day in favor of the people for when those who defended the barricades in the street learned that their houses were being plundered they left the principal fight and hastened to their defence this caused the old bridge to be lost the bardi fled in all directions and were received into the houses of the quaratesi panzanesi and mozzi the people especially the lower classes greedy for spoil sacked and destroyed their houses and pulled down and burned their towers and palaces with such outrageous fury that the most cruel enemy of the florentine name would have been ashamed of taking part in such wanton destruction the nobility being thus overcome the people reformed the government and as they were of three kinds the higher the middle and the lower class it was ordered that the first should appoint two seigneurs the two latter three each and that the gonfaloniers should be chosen alternately from either party besides this all the regulations for the restraint of the nobility were renewed and in order to weaken them still more many were reduced to the grade of the people the ruin of the nobility was so complete and depressed them so much that they never afterward ventured to take arms for the recovery of their power but soon became humbled and abject in the extreme and thus florence lost the generosity of her character and her distinction in arms after these events the city remained in peace till the year thirteen fifty three in the course of this period occurred the memorable plague described with so much eloquence by giovanni boccaccio and by which florence lost ninety-six thousand souls in thirteen forty eight began the first war with the visconti occasioned by the archbishop then prince of milan and when this was concluded dissensions again arose in the city for although the nobility were 